Vamos, vamos dar o início, então. É, bom, eu vou explicar um pouquinho como é que vai ser a dinâmica do, do minicurso, né? porque esse minicurso vai ser um pouquinho diferente o formato dele do que tradicionalmente é no NIEP, vai ser um pouco mais dinâmico e a gente vai contar mais com a participação ativa do, do, do público, ou seja, de vocês. É, bom, o Kevin, para quem não, não estava aqui né, no, na outra mesa, sobre a Revolução Russa, que foi na, na quarta-feira, o Kevin Murphy é professor da Universidade de Massachusetts, nos Estados Unidos. Ele tem uma pesquisa sobre o Soviet de Petrogrado. Ele lançou recentemente esse livro, Revolution and Counter-Revolution, Class Struggle in a Moscow Metal Factory, ele foi vencedor do, do prêmio Isaac e Tamara Deutscher, de 2005. É, infelizmente, ele não trouxe para vender, mas uma coisa bem acessível para nós aqui é, é a série que ele está coordenando na, na revista Jacoban, e que também está sendo traduzida... Jacobin. É, também está sendo traduzida no blog Junho, é, os artigos, então... É, a maioria já está tá sendo disponibilizada bastante rápido na internet. É, bom, acho que era isso, essas três informações. Como que vai ser a dinâmica do curso? É, a gente vai, eu, o Kevin vai fazer uma apresentação de 15 minutos, um panorama né, da Revolução Russa, do Soviet de Petrogrado, em 17. E aí a gente, ele vai fazer seis sessões que são exatamente os seis documentos que estão nesse material. Tem seis é, sessões, está né, dividido. E, então, cada sessão, ele vai fazer uma breve apresentação de cinco minutos e depois é, vai abrir para questões para ser discutidos os documentos, os seis documentos. E aí cada sessão vai ter mais ou menos 20 minutos de discussão. O minicurso vai até 5 e meia, 5 e 40. Então, vai dar certinho para a gente ter uma apresentação dele, mais uma, uma discussão de 20 minutos em cada sessão. Acho que, sem mais delongas, vou passar a palavra ao Kevin. Thank you very much, Kevin. Let's start. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to start by um, giving a brief overview of the historiography of 1917 and then talk a little bit about the Petrograd Soviet um, and what we hope to get from this mini course. And then we will have six sections. Um, and for each of those sections, I will give a brief introduction. But uh, for the course really to work, it's a participatory uh, endeavor. And it's not just me speaking for four hours. You don't want to hear me speak for four hours. You get very bored. Uh, it really depends on the participation of the audience and looking at the documents and criticizing the documents and uh, um, hopefully having good discussion also on 1917. So um, I think the, the best place to start when we talk about the historiography of 1917, um, since we just saw a fantastic play on 10 Days That Shook the World, is to discuss the classics, that is, uh, Uh, the, the main one, uh, in my opinion, would be this one. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is translated into Portuguese, the uh, Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution. It uh, is a classic in many sense. Um, first of all, he was there. Uh, he was a major figure in it, even though in his own book he's not such a major figure, but he understood what was happening Uh, and he had access to documents, even in Turkey in 1930, when he wrote the book, he brought many documents with him. Uh, so we can only imagine what his, how much better this book would have been if he was in Moscow and had access to all the documents. But that being said, I mean, it's an amazing book. There's uh, literally uh, thousands of citations. Um, and his perception of what was happening, I think, is, is unrivaled. That is no matter if you had a hundred historians working together, they're not going to have the same understanding of events because our understanding is not going to be uh, the same level as Trotsky. Um, now, the one problem with Trotsky, which we're hoping to, to uh, address as a, a group of historians, 
if you look at the end of the chapters, there's no footnotes. And sometimes um, academics uh, use this as an excuse to critique it, I think unfairly, because uh, Trotsky did not, you know, he's, his, his argument was I didn't want to encumber the text by putting all these footnotes in. The problem with that is that it allows uh, anti-communist historians to say, well, we don't know if this is true, uh, even though we know it's true. Um, so what we have done as a group, uh, I'm working with about a dozen historians and we're hoping to make uh, a long-term project uh, now that we have access to all the materials is over a period of time, and this can't be done by one or two or even 10 historians, it's something we're gonna try to do as a collective over a period of years is to start adding the footnotes to it so that we don't have to listen to this argument that we don't know if it's true or not. So this, in my opinion, this is the, the classic work on uh, 1917, uh, and it is unrivaled, and it will be unrivaled because tr of Trotsky's uh, role in 1917 and his understanding of it. Um, but there's other works that I think are, are very important uh, that would fit into this notion of classic works. John Reed's Ten Days That Shook the World is a very important book. Um, we have Sukhanov's Seven Volumes, which is abridged in, in English. It's abridged into about a 600-page book. I don't know if this has been translated into Portuguese. Uh, Sukhanov, uh, Lev Menshevik, a uh, very important book um, because he's, uh, he's not a member of the Bolsheviks. His wife was a member of the Bolsheviks. She understood the, the politics better than he did. But he recognizes the importance of Bolshevism and details it from a critical perspective. So this is a very important book. Uh, obviously, uh, Victor Serge, Year One. And this is really more about um, the end of 1917 and into 1918, but this is another classic. Then we have uh, Lenin's writings, the three volumes on 1917. Uh, if you're studying this book, I would strongly recommend that you do it in conjunction with reading Lenin's uh, uh, three volumes on 1917. Um, and then we have um, other people like Krupskaya and Alexandra Kolontai, um, uh, Alexander Shlyapnikov, the people that were there, the, the, the people that understood what was happening and were participants in it, wrote a very rich history, and in some ways, it's the best history because it's by people that were there and were living it and understood the changes that were taking place. So that's the, the I would start with the classics when we talk about 1917. And then we have to talk about uh, the people that I called um, the social historians of 1917. And to understand uh, the impact of people like Alexander Rabinowitz and David Mandel, we have to start with the totalitarian school. That is, um, we have to remember that the institutions, Harvard University, Princeton University, Yale, all these institutions built Russian studies departments. Why? Why did they build them? They built them to demonize the Russian Revolution right from the start. And the totalitarian model uh, it's interesting um, if you look at the history of the totalitarian model. The totalitarian model basically says that the, the state pulverizes society and tells people what to do. The sort of the nastiest perception of revolution is the totalitarian model. This model was actually invented uh, as an ideological tool against the Nazis. And at the end of the war, with the Nazis gone and Germany carved up by the imperialist powers, the new enemy, of course, was the Soviet Union, and they took this totalitarian paradigm and said, okay, here it is with the Nazis, we don't need this anymore, we'll just use the same model, and we'll stamp the Soviet Union with this. So the origin of the totalitarian school actually was against the Nazis, and they just simply said, well, who's our enemy now, and we'll call them the regime totalitarian. And the reason I mention this, and you, you probably heard of some of these figures like Richard uh, Pipes, whose hero is uh, Kornilov, uh, the man who wanted to slaughter the Bolsheviks and slaughter the left. Uh, and he says things like, uh, uh, Russian people desired a strong uh, government that would show force and power. Now that's partially correct, 
uh, but he left out an adjective. It wasn't the Russian people, it was the rich Russian people that wanted a strong government and to slaughter the left. So this entire paradigm of the Cold War uh, really dominated for a period, for really a, a couple of decades until they were challenged by uh, the social historians who uh, really look, used E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class as the model. That is, uh, before E.P. Thompson's book, history, for the most part, whether, uh, uh, I guess there's some exceptions with the French Revolution, but for the most part, it's history from above. And E.P. Thompson's work really ushered in a period of looking at history from below. That is, the people, the normal working class people, uh, peasants, soldiers, uh, it encouraged a new generation of historians uh, to look at the actions and thoughts of working people. That's the main thing. But it didn't just come out of nowhere. It came out of the social movements, particularly um, the anti-war movement uh, in the United States, the black power movement, the women's movement, uh, that radicalization ushered in uh, this challenge to the totalitarian school and to, to the old way of looking at history from above, uh, and it had a major impact uh, on Russian studies. Um, the work of Alexander Rubinowitz, uh, in my opinion, is, was the most important. Uh, I, I don't think this has been translated to Portuguese yet, but uh, this is a fantastic, there's a two volume set he has a, a first volume on the June and July days, and then the Bolsheviks come to power. Uh, I've talked to some people about maybe we can try to get this translated. This is a fantastic book, and I'll just give you, I just want to give one quote from this um, to see how it compares with the totalitarian model that I just mentioned. The phenomenal Bolshevik su success can be attributed in no, sm no small measure to the nature of the party in 1917. Here I have in mind Lenin's bold and determined leadership, the immense historical significance of which cannot be denied, nor the Bolshevik proverbial, though vastly exaggerated, organizational, organizational unity and discipline. Rather, I would emphasize the party's internally relatively democratic tolerant and decentralized structure and methods of operation, as well as essentially open and mass character in striking contrast to the traditional Leninist model. So here you have somebody who is arguing exactly 180 degrees against the totalitarian model and saying, and we had this discussion the other night, if you were here, that how did, how did the Bolsheviks overcome some of the conservative influences uh, in the party? And what he argues, what Rabinowitz argues, is because they're democratic. It's not because they're undemocratic, it's because this is a party of the masses that was open to the left, and the pressure of the, uh, of the Viborg workers continually challenged the leadership. So a dynamic, open, mass party uh, uh, and that's one of the reasons I love this book. It's a, it's a fantastic book, uh, but it's not just Rabinowitz. Uh, there were people like David Mandel who wrote two volumes on the workers' movement, uh, Grigory Suni who wrote on the Baku Common, uh, Hasegawa's very important book on the Petrograd uh, uh, Revolution of February, uh, about a dozen very important social histories from below, which really challenged and in some ways put the Cold War people on their backs. That is, it really changed. It, 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 these people basically proved what socialists had been arguing since 1917, uh, that there was a social revolution. Uh, and it was a very uh, important moment. I, I do want to say this, however, that it was, it, because it was so tied to the social movements, that it was um, episodic. That is, the influence of these uh, radical historians uh, and these, these modern classics, if you will, uh, did not last. Uh, and in fact, some of these historians are now even questioning their own work. In edit editing this Jacobin series, um, it was actually a little frustrating to find enough Marxist historians who would approach the revolution. Uh, the purpose of our entire series was to 
challenged the conservative view of the revolution, and it was not that easy to find enough historians that were willing to do so. So just to give you, oh, and I should also mention, uh, so most of these people are either from England or uh, the United States or Canada, but I also think it's incumbent to mention a couple of, uh, of other important works. One is, uh, and you can probably tell by the year, 1956, a Soviet scholar, uh, Ian Bojalov, wrote a very important book challenging the very simplistic Soviet version that said the party can do no wrong uh, in his book on the February Revolution. And, and he was not only risking his career by writing something like this, it, it was a really a bold statement against the, the, the Stalinist hold on the, uh, of, on the history, that is history as a commodity that had to be controlled. Uh, and he challenged it. And Bojalov's book on uh, the 1917 uh, February Revolution is another classic. And then one other book, uh, there's so many that are good, but uh, another book, that, a couple books that I think uh, are worth mentioning are a book by the Czech Marxist historian uh, Michel Ryman, who wrote a, a very important book in 1968 along the same lines of looking at history from below uh, and critiquing not the Western model, but the simplistic Soviet or Stalinist version of events. And then he also wrote a very important book on the origins of the Stalinist system that I think is very good. So um, uh, uh, a radical history that really th sort of thrived in the 60s and 70s, but uh, for the most part is no longer um, as strong as it was. That is, the pressures of academia are, are strong. And I wanted to give two examples of that. One is in 1996, there was a book written by a man named David Fogelsong who uh, wrote, uh, the title of the book is America's Secret War Against Bolshevism. And what he did is he had access to the archives, the United States uh, previously secret archives, and he showed that, uh, and people on the left knew this, but we could not prove it. He went and he proved it, that the United States was giving literally uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to the white armies uh, to support uh, the overthrow of the Bolshevik uh, dictatorship. So not only did the, many of these countries invade Russia, they were the ones who funded uh, some of the most uh, ugly and nasty thugs of the 20th century. In fact, uh, Fogelsong's book describes how the money is getting to Russia and the American um, officers in charge are, are saying, you really want us to, these people are barbarians. You want us to give them money to overthrow the Bolsheviks? And uh, Secretary of State Lansing said, well, the question is, are they against the Bolsheviks? That's the main question. And they said, yes, well then, we're not going to worry about who they are and what they believe in. As long as they're willing to get rid of the, the Bolsheviks, they're our guys. Um, and so that one of the main overlooked incidents of American domination uh, and imperialism really started in 1917. But the point I wanted to make about that book is 21 years later, how many times has that book been cited by uh, American and Western historians? Zero. It, it, it's not something that historians today are willing to talk about because it doesn't fit into what is unfortunately, again, the agenda of academia, which is to demonize not the people who invaded the Russian Revolution, uh, but the people who helped bring it about. Um, and then the second example I wanted to give to show how things have shifted to the right is that um, there's four volumes now on the Petrograd Soviet, and that's one of the reasons I decided to do this study, is that over the course of, uh, of about 15 years, there's four very thick volumes of the minutes of the Petrograd Soviet, and I'll discuss that in a minute. But what is important is nobody has used those volumes. And one of the reasons I decided to do it is that um, people in academia are just no longer interested in 1917. This is the most important institution of 1917. Nobody's interested in it at all. So it's somewhat similar to this issue about the US invasion. Let's not talk about the, the revolution that much anymore. That's, that's in, the, in the past. We don't care about it. Um, but of course, people on the left do care about it. And that's sort of the, that was my inspiration. This history from below is my inspiration for, uh, for starting um, the study of the Petrograd Soviet. Now, I wanted to say a few things about, um, 
uh, the Petrograd Soviet and a little bit about what we're hope we should hope to get out of this. Um, the Petrograd Soviet it was very different from 1905. 1905, the Petrograd Soviet, uh, uh, the, the name of the city changed. It was the Petersburg Workers' Soviet in 1905, and it grew out of the mass strike, and it was an institution of revolutionary power. The reality of the February Revolution in 1917 was that the Soviet that was formed happened, was created after the struggle. That is, nobody expected the czarist regime to fall in four days. Um, and when the Soviet was formed, it was actually a, uh, formed by the Mensheviks, and they made a deal with some of the leaders of the of the Duma. And uh, if you look at Kerensky's um, memoirs, he said, "Well, uh, Skobolev, who is one of the Menshevik leaders, came to me, and he said, can we have a room because we want to organize this Soviet?" And I said, "Well, what's the purpose of this?" He said, "Well, well we need to take care of the workers and soldiers to to not let get things." get too volatile. We'll take care of the workers if you let us have this Soviet. And he said, okay, we'll let you have the Soviet. So it's a very, from its very beginning, it had a very different connotation than in 1905, where it was a fighting force of the masses. Um, um, but over the course of, because it was a democratically elected institution, over the course of uh, eight months, that would change. But from its start, uh, it was also uh, an institution that represented the soldiers also, even more so than the workers. That is, um, of about 3,000 representatives, um, 2,000 of those represented the soldiers. And in the city of Petro, the, the, in Petrograd, there were about maybe 15, uh, 150,000 soldiers, and there were maybe 300,000 industrial workers. So by the fact that the soldiers uh, have twice as many representatives, you can see that it's actually four or five times more uh, in favor of the soldiers. And unfortunately, that also meant that women, um, and this is gonna be a, a missing chapter tonight or today in our discussion, it meant that women were vastly underrepresented uh, in the Soviet um, as were workers, but even more so women. There were only several dozen women represented uh, in the Soviet. Um, and there really, right now, there is not enough information on that, and I have to apologize for that. And it, it's incumbent upon me to to find out, um, you know, why why was it that the Soviet did not have more a strong representation of women, um, and uh, what the, what activities did those women get involved in, and what did they say in the Soviet? I simply, right now, I don't have enough information on that, so I apologize for that. But um, the history, everybody recognized the power of uh, the Soviet. Uh, the central importance of the Petrograd Soviet was recognized by all the protagonists across the political pers uh, um, perspectives. That is, everybody recognized that the Petrograd uh, the Soviet uh, was the only institution that really had popular support. So, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute in our first section uh, when we get into some of the details of the um, creation of the Soviet, but everybody across the political spectrum uh, recognized the power of the Soviet. Um, whether on the extreme right, that is people like Kornilov said that we have to destroy the Soviet, um, and also the liberals eventually came to that conclusion, Milikov and the cadet party. Um, so uh, just a few words about how I wanted to organize this. So uh, we have, there were a whole number of different institutions. It had its own newspaper. It had six or seven different committees, including uh, committees for uh, provisions of, uh, of fuel, uh, food provisions. Uh, it had a military organization that was set up during the Kornilov uh, affair that we'll talk about. It had an anti-Semitic uh, um, organization that helped to try to combat uh, anti-Semitic um, violence. Uh, that was taking place during the revolutionary year. It had all sorts of committees and institutions, um, and it was funded by the masses. So this is a popular democratic institution with different political uh, opinions, and as a battle, as an ideological uh, arena, it was the battle place in which different ideas were argued out, um, and because it was, uh, because of the notion of instant recall, which meant that 
um, every factory uh, based on one out of every thousand workers could send a representative, but they could also re-elect those representatives. So the number of deputies that were supportive of, say, the Bolsheviks or the Mensheviks or the SRs was always in flux. So that, um, that measure of who was involved in the Soviet constantly changed. And the general, it's not a straight line, but the general tendency was uh, for the influence of the far left uh, to grow over a period of time. So um, that's a general introduction. Uh, what I would like to do, so we have, uh, there were six major events in uh, 1917. The February Revolution, the crisis over Milikov's note in April of 1917, which was the first round of um, popular demonstrations against the provisional government. Uh, then in June, because of the planned war offensive, there was a mass demonstration of 400,000. The July days was a period of uh, semi-insurrection. Uh, it's, it's not really sufficient to call that a demonstration. It was more of an insurrection. Then you have the attempted Kornilov coup in uh, August and early September. And then you have the, 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 the left shift to the Bolsheviks uh, and the October Revolution. So what I would like to do uh, and propose this is that for each of these sections, uh, we have five documents. And that's, that's quite a few documents, but there's no hurry. We have plenty of time to do it. Uh, I will give a brief, no more than five minute introduction to each of the sections. And then what I would like to do is open it up for discussion. That is, I, I, I'm more than willing to answer questions, but I think uh, there's enough uh, experts in the audience that also know quite a bit. I've been to a number of sessions, so I know this as a fact, not an opinion, that there's a quite a number of you that uh, are familiar with the Russian Revolution. And even, even if you're not, by looking at these documents, your opinion is important. That is, to, to have a successful class um, I'm hoping that everybody uh, will try to contribute in a small way to a lively discussion on the documents. Um, and I want to say this about the primary documents. I tried to uh, include a variety of different types of documents. So there's some, some from Lenin and Trotsky, but uh, different political perspectives. I included some of the, uh, um, the minutes of the Petrograd Soviet also. I included uh, some memoirs. So there's a, a fairly lively and, and different selection of documents. Um, and also some newspaper clippings from Izvestia, which was the, the, the Soviet's newspaper. Um, so what I'm hoping is, uh, is that everybody can, can look at these documents and come up with your opinion. That, that's really what its history should be about. It's not. It's not an exact science. We're looking at documents. And the advantage of primary documents is, uh, rather than listening to what I have to say or some other historian, we're looking at documents at, um, in which the active players who were involved in the revolution wrote the documents. So we need to keep in mind the biases of all the documents. Whether, even if it's Lenin and Trotsky, however much we might like them, uh, all documents have biases and we need to keep that in mind when we're trying to critique the documents. So um, is that agreeable that we can uh, try to do this? So what I would suggest is um, we'll start with the February Revolution. Um, I think we handed out about 30 copies. If we can share those, that would be useful. And then we'll also, sh uh, do we have Wi-Fi? Do you know? No? OK, so um, if you don't have, uh, I would ask that. Uh, People try to share the documents the best they can. And then if, if you don't have a copy of the documents, maybe it would make sense to, to come forward so that you can, you can see the documents. Uh, I'm not sure you're going to be able to see from that far. But if you can, that's fine. And then um, so I will give no more than my role I, I, is more of a facilitator rather than a lecturer. I guess that's the way I would look at it. So I will give a short introduction. To, uh, to each of the sections, and then we can step through the documents, and uh, I'm interested in, I hope other people are too, of, of hearing what other people have to say about the documents. Oh, 
Esses documentos estão, estão disponíveis na página do NIEP. Quem estiver conseguindo acessar aí... A... É. Na página do, do NIEP tem um linkzinho, mini curso de hoje, e tem lá. Conseguiu aí? Entrar aí? Ah, é. Para os inscritos foi enviado por e-mail também, né? Yeah, so uh, yeah, why don't we? We'll st I'll start with the, um, and I, please cut me off after five minutes. That it should not take more than five minutes. So for each section, I will give five minute introduction, and then we can step through the documents, and people can give their opinion of them and what the, those documents tell us about uh, that period. So um, the first section, which I've already touched on a little bit, is the period that I would call uh, the honeymoon period. And by that I mean the formation of the provisional government side by side with the Petrograd Soviet. Uh, and one of the most amazing things about the February Revolution, uh, a number of things. One, it happened so quickly that is nobody, even the Bolsheviks, did not expect the overthrow of, uh, of the regime in four days. And then secondly, the outcome was very different from what anybody expected or anybody could have predicted beforehand. That is, instead of some, some kind of radical government, the socialists demanded that these people who were actually the liberals who were against the revolution to begin with should take power. So the provisional government was an unelected institution. Some of them, most of them had been in the Duma, but they were not elected to rule. That is, the, there was a promise of a constituent assembly in the future. And one of the more incredible aspects of this is that they were even willing to allow czarism to stay in power. That is, uh, there were negotiations, and Mulikov said, well, we need to have um, the czar's brother, Michael, rule. And these socialist uh, leaders, contemplated doing that. They were, Michael wasn't interested in it, but they were, they were discussing it and they were willing to let that happen. So the first, the first formation, the first session of the Petrograd Soviet was on March 27th, uh, uh, and I'm using the old, for t today's purposes, I think we should use the old uh, calendar days. Um, it was on March 27th. Within a few weeks, there were 2,800 representatives Uh, as I mentioned, the soldiers were vastly um, um, strongly represented than the workers. Uh, a lower representation, especially since the women had initiated the revolution, the women, women workers in the, in the uh, textile factories were grossly underrepresented. Um, but this institution was seen by everybody in the country, uh, workers, soldiers, peasants, as an institution of revolutionary rule. Um, so there's this balancing act between this provisional government, and they were the, the leaders of the provisional government were quite open about acknowledging that the only way they could rule was by power being handed to them by the Soviet. So this situation of dual power, uh, and both Lenin and Trotsky made the argument that it was an inherently unstable relationship because the provisional government represented the interest of the ruling class parties, that is the bourgeoisie and the landowners, and this revolutionary institution of the masses um, hopefully would represent the interest in the long term of, of uh, the workers and the soldiers and the peasants. So this unstable institution came into being. Um, uh, just very briefly, Lenin's April thesis, which I did not include in the documents. And why did I not do that? Well, to be honest, if I included the best writings of Lenin and Trotsky, we would have 30 documents of Lenin and Trotsky. It's not to say that Lenin's arguments aren't important. In fact, they're very important. But I wanted to have a wide variety of documents. But I should mention that Lenin's April thesis is very important because the Bolsheviks changed their position from one in which they believed, uh, Lenin argued in 1905, and this remained their position, that the coming revolution would be bourgeois, democratic, um, but the bourgeoisie would be against the revolution. 
um, which is very different from the Menshevik position where they were arguing that uh, uh, the bourgeoisie, we should not frighten them. But all the socialist groups prior to 1917 agreed on the minimal program of a constituent assembly, land reform, land to the peasants in some way, uh, and an eight hour day. And in the early days of this honeymoon period, they were willing to renege on that. That is this, well, we don't wanna, we don't wanna have things go too far because even on the eight hour day, uh, that only happened by direct action of the workers themselves, not because the Petrograd so Soviet was willing to fight. So this honeymoon period, this first section that we're gonna discuss, the framework is let's not push too hard uh, for fear of, um, of the bourgeoisie becoming counter-revolutionary. That's, that is sort of the thinking of, uh, that was behind that. And we also have to recognize, in addition to that, uh, one last comment before we get into the documents, is that the Bolsheviks at the time uh, were fairly conservative before Lenin's arrival. That is, they agreed uh, that with the continuation of the war on a defensive stand, uh, they agreed that um, a lot of these issues with, uh, with the provisional government, they deserve critical support. Uh, the term in Russian is postulka, postulka, meaning insofar as they defend the interest of the masses, we're going to support them. Um, but the actual policies of the government and the, the issues, underlying issues, the main issues throughout 1917 are the war, uh, food for the masses, uh, land for the peasants, and control of the factories. The, these issues come up again and again and again. Uh, and none of those issues was really uh, adequately addressed at all in the February Revolution. So that's why uh, historians like David Mandel call it the honeymoon period, where um, the middle classes come to the streets with pink ribbons on and red ribbons and saying, we're for the revolution also but it is only by ignoring uh, the larger political issues, if that makes sense. So why don't we take a moment uh, to look over the, should we do this one document at a time? What, what would you suggest? Yeah, okay, so why don't we start with, um, and this, this first document I think is a good summation of this notion of a compromise. Uh, and that's why I chose that one. So Izvestia is the newspaper of the Petrograd Soviet. Um, why don't we take a few minutes to read that and then we'll just open it up to discussion. Yeah. So one point, we can start with 1.1. Five minutes. Five minutes uh, yeah, three or four minutes. Does anybody have, not have access? Should, can you ask? Does anybody not have access to the documents? Alguém está sem o documento, sem acesso nenhum ao documento? Que aí a gente pode ir passando aqui no. A gente distribuiu algumas cópias, né, para quem chegou depois. E aí quem tiver com essas cópias, solidariamente pode ler em dois ou três. E também tem na internet, como eu disse antes. Ele vai dar uns quatro, cinco minutinhos para a gente lê ou relê, e aí ele, a gente vai abrir para as questões. Então, vamos começar o, o debate sobre o documento número 1. Um. É, gostaríamos de um voluntário para dar o... O primeiro chute, Tiago, <risos> quer começar? Não? Dani? <risos> ah, o Márcio, tá. Há uh, o Márcio que veio para trazer um café, ele está trazendo um café. Marcelo. Depois você pode rodar o microfone na plateia? 
Posso? É, acho que seria interessante que Kevin pudesse é, explicar que tipo de conexão direta que o documento número 1 um, é, menciona, que tipo de conexão direta entre o Soviet e o governo provisório foi construído naquele momento. Ou seja, havia representantes do Soviet atuando no governo provisório ou essa conexão era mais indireta? Acho que essa era uma explicação interessante para... É, uma curiosidade para o Kevin, uh, você mencionou que o Soviet ele surge como meio como uma manobra dos mencheviques para, digamos assim, conter a mobilização das massas, mas que pela estrutura democrática ele rapidamente assume outros ares. Uh, essa estrutura democrática ela começa já desde a proposta dos mencheviques ou ela surge mais para uma pressão das bases? Eu vou fazer uma questão também. Gostaria de saber sobre o jornal Svetia. Não sei como se pronuncia. É, como era, como foi construído, como era dirigido, por quem, se eram eleitos os, os, os editores, como é que ele era moldado, editado. Enfim, queria saber mais sobre o Svetsia. É, eu, gostaria de, eu gostaria de saber, com relação ao caráter conservador dos bolcheviques, se esse caráter conservador do, dos bolcheviques dentro desse período fez com que eles... É, apoiassem o governo provisório, né? E só depois que, a partir de, é, de que o senhor tinha falado antes, né? Que depois de Lênia, que da chegada de Lênia, que, que é, mudou, digamos assim, os rumos, né? Se essa colaboração com o governo provisório é, não seria esse, não evidencia esse caráter conservador, uma coisa assim. É, o documento ele faz uma defesa né, da colaboração com o governo provisório, mas ele não entra numa caracterização maior do governo provisório. E aí a pergunta é se essa defesa da colaboração era por só um, um temor é, de uma restauração é, conservadora ou se tinha uma caracterização de, um, de que o governo poderia ser progressista do ponto de vista dos trabalhadores e tal. Então, uma questão, você se citou o caso do que os mencheviques que reconstruíram o, o Soviet em 17, né? tem, tem uma polêmica, inclusive, sobre a origem dos Soviets, se de fato eles são uma criação, inclusive, dos mencheviques em 1905, se isso prevalece ou se isso é uma análise equivocada. Tem um texto do, que vai tratar dessa forma, né? do História do Marxismo, né? do Robbins Bauer. É, boa tarde a todos. É, eu gostaria que o, que o Kevin explicasse melhor essa parte da questão conservadora do Partido Bolchevique, explicando mais a questão, ou a posição do Stalin e do Zinov, dentro do Pravda, como é, que, como é que eram essas posições que eles tomavam, como foi esse giro do Pravda. E é isso. Ok, 
Okay. Uh, well, we can start with this. Um, uh, uh, one more question. Uh, one more, sure. Obrigado. É, na verdade, não é uma questão, é só uma observação. Eu não conheço quase nada sobre a Revolução Russa, muito pouco. Agora, lendo é, esse, esse documento, me parece assim, que tem muito a mão de, de militar, né, de soldado. Até é, em um momento aqui, eu não sei se é da tradução, mas é, termina com certo colapso da Revolução Nacional. Aí também é essa questão do medo desse fantasma vermelho, e, e a forma como é escrita, eu não sei se, se isso corresponde ou não, mas é, sei, é, até pelo que você disse, de, de, que nesse início você tinha onde é, 3 mil delegados, né, 2 mil eram soldados, aí eu não sei até que ponto também isso é, acaba se refletindo aqui né, na redação desse documento. E imagino que, que você disse que tinha, tinha um instant recall lá, é, se isso vai se transformando, não olhei os outros documentos, mas imagino que isso pode ir se transformando, mudando a composição também, né, dos documentos. Tipo, okay, I, I would start with the the last comment, which I think is is very good. I mean, it, I I think the fear of the red menace, that is, the, uh, the perspective that we do not want to break with the bourgeoisie is what, in my opinion, this document is all about. Uh, whether or not um, it's from a military perspective or not, I hadn't even thought about it. I think that's, that's a good point. But the notion of not scaring the bourgeoisie was the main reason I included this document. And I think that this notion that it, uh, as a nation we have to come together uh, in a class alliance, even with the bourgeoisie, is what defines the February Revolution and this, this, uh, this period of the honeymoon. Um, so I think this is a very good comment. Uh, and I, I appreciate this. I think you've, you've hit on the main point of, about the February Revolution. Um, so for some of the other questions, please help me if I can't remember all the questions. Um, the question of the conservatism of Bolshevism is very important. Um, in many cities, we have to remember that the Bolsheviks were a small organization at, in February and so were the Mensheviks. And on the major minimal program, they actually had agreement. In fact, when Lenin arrived in Petrograd, there was a meeting organized by Kamenev and Stalin for unity with the Mensheviks. Why did that happen? Because the Bolsheviks' perspective was that the, the revolution would be bourgeois democratic, and they were working in many locales with the Mensheviks, and this is what they were fighting for. Lenin very early on recognized that his ambig what I think is an ambiguous um, perspective, that is a bourgeois democratic revolution carried out against the wishes of the bourgeoisie came into conflict with the reality of the February revolution. That is the old perspective no longer fit. But for many rank-and-file Bolsheviks, it wasn't just Kamenev and Stalin. It made sense. We have this revolution. We're having a bourgeois revolution. We agree on the major issues, so we should work with the Mensheviks. So it was, a, in my opinion, this, I'm expressing my opinion. It's one of those issues where it's open to different interpretations. But in my opinion, the old perspective of Bolshevism open the door to different interpretations and cooperation with the Mensheviks and also supporting the provisional government in a critical manner. Um, so on some of the other questions, is Vestia, if the creation of the Soviet on the 27th, um, 
people, workers were actually talking about it on the first day of the revolution. So um, perhaps the way I phrased it was a little bit too simplistic. It, it was part of the tradition of the revolutionary movement. People remembered it. But it was not emphasized by the Bolsheviks. Uh, if you look at Lenin's writings, the only time he mentions it during the war is October uh, 1915, when the Petrograd Committee of the Bolsheviks started saying, this was a militant period during the war where it went from a nationalist to the left, and when the Tsar um, prorogued the Duma, there were massive demonstrations. And the Bolsheviks started putting forward a, uh, the call for Soviets in Petrograd. Lenin's position at the time was stop all this talk about Soviets. The only time he talked about Soviets was to say no. The Soviets, based on the experience in 1905, only came about after months and months of revolutionary struggle. That is, it's an institution that comes through revolutionary experience. We don't call for it into being. So the Bolsheviks, and Lenin in particular, did not conceive of this pace of events. So there's a number of factors that we're talking about here. Nobody predicted that five days after the start of the revolution that the Tsar would be gone and there would be this new situation. So the entire perspective of the left, including the Bolsheviks, is thrown into crisis and they need to rethink things. And in my opinion, Lenin, and Trotsky, even though he was in New York City, that perspective of recognizing that on the one hand there's a provisional government and on the other hand there's Soviets and it's an unstable class situation, it's not something everybody understood. So the old formulas, trying to fit old formulas into new conditions, um, caused this confusion. And I think one of the, the frustrations that we're all having right now is because there was confusion. It's not clear cut what people were fighting for at the time. Um, the main point of this first document, I think the comrade, uh, who, I think has already hit on it, but some of the other questions that came up, can you help me, help me with some of the other questions? Um, so the conservatism of the Bolsheviks. Uh, the newspaper, uh, the formation of the Soviets it was part of the tradition, and I, I think it maybe was a little bit heavy-handed to sort of blame it on the, on the Mensheviks. But their conception of class collaboration was definitely comes through in this document, defines Menshevism in 1917. And that's, that's the reason we inclu I included this document. This cooperate, we cannot the bourgeoisie should not be afraid of what we're doing. We need them. We're incapable of running society. They say this in their documents. We need the bourgeoisie to rule because we are incapable of ruling. That becomes part of the perspective which we'll see in many of the other documents which persists. Um, but tradi the tradition of the Soviet, workers were talking about that on the first day. The perspective of the Mensheviks um, and I didn't mean to characterize it as a coup, but their, their perspective is we don't want to take power. They were explicit about that. We do not want power. We need to give power to the class that should rule, which is the bourgeoisie. Even if we want to control them, we should not take power. Uh, so what, so, as about uh, Stalin, Kamenev, and the Pravda. About which? Stalin, Kamenev, and the Pravda. Okay. So uh, within the Bolsheviks, there were uh, different tendencies. The most militant section before Lenin arrived were the factories in uh, the industrial Viborg district. Some of those workers on their own, without reading Lenin, said, we should take power. What are we doing with this deal with the, uh, with the bourgeoisie? Why are we continuing the war? It's a, it was a minority of the Bolsheviks, but it was a strong minority of the best militants that, because of their class instincts, knew that what Stalin and Kamenev were doing 
went against the revolutionary tradition. It's not because they had a theory of permanent revolution or because they uh, had the same necessarily understanding that Lenin did about the dual power situation. It was based on their own good feeling of the situation and saying, we don't trust, why should we trust this deal with the capitalist? Uh, so the extreme left and Shlyapnikov, who was uh, in a, a Molotov, were leaders before Stalin and Kamenev returned, and they took a fairly radical position against the provisional government and against the war. Um, I think it's fair to characterize Stalin and Kamenev as more diplomatic. In fact, Stalin saw his role as trying to balance the extreme left with the rank and file members in locals that were working with the Mensheviks and saying, well, we have to have some kind of compromise here. So it was not a clear perspective that Stalin was arguing for prior to Lenin's return. But if you look at what, uh, and Trotsky is very good on this. He details this, and so does uh, um, uh, Rabinowicz. They supported the war. No matter how they qualified it, they supported the war. And this went against old Lenin, not just new Lenin. This, Lenin never supported the war. And they supported the provisional government. They, they did it in a very qualified way, but they came out in support of the provisional government in this Russian term, postulka, postulka which means um, insofar as they carry out the wishes of the masses. And Lenin's response was, how can a bourgeois government carry out the wishes of the masses? How is this possible? Uh, and that's, I, I'm sure you know about this, the Lenin's thesis, which was a critique of that perspective. But uh, the point I'm trying to make about uh, Stalin and Kamenev is they didn't just come up with these ideas out of nowhere. They were trying to balance in a diplomatic way the different tendencies within the Bolshevik. Rather than taking a clear position, they were trying to balance, in my opinion, the different tendencies within the Bolshevik party, even if it meant compromise on principles. Unity with the Mensheviks. You know, within one day, Lenin blew that up. Uh, and we'll talk about that in, the, in some of the other documents. So, so uh, uh, are there que other questions that I missed? I'm, I apologize if I forgot all to. The last one, I, I, don't, um, I don't remember what was. Did I, did I miss any of the other issues, the major ones? Probably not. Danny? It's a, É, era sobre, a, sobre como eles viam a caracterização do governo, se eles é, apoiavam, é, apostavam, mas acho que você respondeu parcialmente, se eles apoiavam é, o governo por uma caracterização de que o governo ainda poderia ser progressista para os trabalhadores, ou se era por um medo de uma, é, de uma restauração, de uma contra-revolução, enfim, de perder o que tinha se conquistado, ou se era, num, de fato, num apoio... Né? Uh, they being uh, the Mensheviks or, or the Bolsheviks? Uh, or the Soviet Soviets, in general? The Soviet de Petrogrado, a partir do documento, né, o que estava se colocando na época. Um, at the time, I, I think the, the, the comrade who made the, the point earlier, I think, did a good summation of it. They believed, they being the SRs and the Mensheviks, and to a lesser extent the Bolsheviks, believed in class collaboration. That's the, sh that's the simplistic, maybe too simplistic version. They believed that the worst thing that could happen was to antagonize the bourgeoisie and push them to take a counter-revolutionary role. So they, had, they believed, and they were explicit about it in this document, we need a compromise. If we push too hard, 
this dyna dynamic of Menshevism, if we push too hard, there will be a counter-revolutionary response. That's their thinking. Um, so I think this, this was excellent. Um, can we take a few minutes? This, this next document, uh, um, order number one, Trotsky calls this the most important uh, document of the February Revolution. So if we can just take a couple minutes, this is a, a very important document. Podemos abrir agora já para o segundo documento, documento 1.2. Marco. É, bom, boa tarde. São dois comentários. Um é sobre, tem, enfim, a leitura do documento demonstra claramente. É, então, são dois comentários. O primeiro é que a leitura do documento demonstra uma preocupação é, com a distribuição do poder dentro das forças armadas. Né? É, propondo, por exemplo, que não os, os oficiais não deveriam ter controle sobre os armamentos, coisas assim. Então, eu queria que você pudesse, por favor, comentar um pouco sobre a reação dos oficiais é, a esse tipo de determinação. E a segunda questão tem a ver com a logística. Eu fiquei muito impressionado porque o documento é de 1 de março e ele determina que, no dia seguinte, pela manhã, representantes de todos os batalhões, tivessem, e regimentos, etc., tivessem é, no Soviet presentes. É, enfim, num momento em que a questão da comunicação era muito mais precária do que é hoje, tal, eu queria também que você comentasse, se puder, um pouco sobre como era feita a difusão dessas deliberações do Soviet, como é que, era, como é que isso chegava em todos os regimentos, como é que, quais eram as redes de organização para isso. Bom, boa tarde. A minha questão vai refletindo um pouco sobre o documento anterior, daquela perspectiva da colaboração de classes. Quando a gente lê esse documento, é, que a data que é, ou é a mesma data ou é bem próximo, é, o que eu refleti foi como uma perspectiva de colaboração de classes nesse documento direciona para uma autonomia de organização militar por parte dos sovietes. Então, me parece que, ao mesmo tempo que, que há, há é, entre os bolcheviques, nesse momento, essa, essa estratégia de colaboração entre as classes, já aponta para uma, um caminho inevitável dessa dualidade de poderes que acaba fortalecendo o controle militar pelos soviets. Então, eu queria que o professor, se ele pudesse falar um pouco sobre essas, essas duas perspectivas, que está cronologicamente uma próxima da outra, dois documentos que falam... É, um que aponta né, para uma colaboração entre as classes e o outro que, pela estratégia militar que adota, está fortalecendo o poder dos soviets nesse momento. Seu nome? Yamara. Obrigado. Obrigado. Meu nome é Vitor. É, professor, é um comentário, não exatamente uma pergunta. Mas a leitura do documento me fez perceber, como já foi dito, é, a preocupação em se valorizar o, os militares, sobretudo os militares de base, né, de modo que eles possam eleger os seus representantes. E é tudo bastante interessante. Mas esse documento me recordou que aqui no Rio de Janeiro, sete anos antes, em 1910, nós tivemos a Revolta da Chibata, que foi um movimento de marinheiros que se revoltaram contra as, as forças superiores do exército, justamente reivindicando o fim da, das chibatadas né? dentro, dentro das forças armadas. 
E esse movimento, ele de certa forma, teve um êxito no sentido de que as chibatas foram abolidas. No entanto, ele foi fortemente suprimido pelo nosso governo, pelas nossas forças militares. E os seus líderes, é, enfim, acabaram no ostracismo, né? acabaram sendo presos. Isso me chamou a atenção pela diferença temporal muito curta entre esses dois movimentos, né? apenas de sete anos. Comentarei essa. Obrigado. Oi, é, mais um comentário também. Eu fiquei pensando um pouco sobre as diferenças né, é, que temporalmente aconteceram, as permanências, as resistências, é, em relação aos soviets, por exemplo. Até queria que você pudesse comentar um pouco sobre a instituição específica, né, o soviet de Petrogrado. É, nascem né, numa, numa, num contexto super autoritário e você tem esse essa fusão democrática e aí depois eles adentram ao governo, né, como uh, né, na época estalinista, etc, é, já como algo tão uh, também antidemocrático, né, mas também tão entranhado, né, tão pouco fluido assim. É, e também uh, alguns comentários também sobre a própria cultura nessa né? essa questão da hierarquia por exemplo os soldados ou seja as pessoas que estão mais abaixo da hierarquia são respeitados né depois na, depois da revolução né de outubro e tal a gente até vê alguns cartazes algumas coisas se referindo aos aos trabalhadores né ou seja aqueles que estão a nível abaixo da hierarquia como tu né como tu então é, acho que é uma, uma diferença também, né? Você sai de um nível hierárquico grande, nobreza, etc. Zarismo é, vai para isso, vai para todo esse respeito e depois você volta um pouco é, para essa esse desrespeito, digamos assim, em algum grau talvez. Um, e também essas saudações obrigatórias, né? Que você não precisava, não precisava, não eram mais obrigatórias, também me chamou a atenção. É, né, porque você também tem o né, mesmo, mesmo processo, né, ao meu ver. Assim, é, sai do, do czarismo, aquela coisa, hierarquia, tudo duro, e vem para isso, e depois você volta, né, principalmente na época estalinista, a essa obrigação. Né, se, você, se você não faz isso, você tem o risco de ser mandado para a Sibéria ou coisa do tipo, né, numa época que até piadas te levavam para a Sibéria. Enfim, fiquei pensando um pouco sobre essas transições, se você puder comentar um pouquinho. Agradeço. É, eu queria que você pudesse falar um pouco sobre o perfil social desses soldados que eram foram eleitos, se tem informação sobre isso, e também sobre o nível de inserção dos partidos de esquerda dentro do Exército nesse momento. Meu nome é José Augusto. É, assumindo que o soviet era é, a expressão da, da representação dos trabalhadores e dos soldados eleitos é, diretamente nos seus locais de, de ação militar ou, ou de trabalho, é, a gente pode entender que o, o primeiro documento, eu estou me referindo a ele, é... Tudo que se falou até agora sobre essa perspectiva de colaboração, supostamente deveria representar a própria confusão que os trabalhadores e os soldados é, expressavam é, na sua luta revolucionária. É claro que esse documento foi supostamente escrito é, por algumas pessoas que representavam as posições é, votadas no Soviet. Então, é, a gente vê, é, em seguida, é, a evolução dos fatos mudando a, a, as posições do próprio Soviet. Né? Então, a questão que eu, que eu coloco é, é a respeito de como essa dinâmica, é, uma vez que são 150, milho, 150 mil trabalhadores, 300, é, 300 mil trabalhadores, 150 mil soldados, e os partidos de esquerda, efetivamente, ainda eram estruturas pequenas, 
Então, o trabalho de, da chamada agitação política, né, o trabalho do, da discussão com as massas a partir desses núcleos é, políticos organizados, é, talvez não alcançasse toda essa base né, de, de, de trabalhadores e de soldados. Então, a minha questão está em torno dessa dinâmica, né, que o Soviet expressa essas posições e muda, vai evoluindo nas suas posições, é, e numa interação do, dos partidos políticos, ainda como estruturas é, pequenas, né, para é, proporcionar essa discussão e a, e a alteração dessas diferentes é, posições políticas. Boa tarde. É, são duas perguntas. A primeira é se a, a deliberação tomada nesse documento de democratizar tanto o poder político quanto o poder material com a distribuição das armas ali, ou, é, se ela, se a, a execução dessa decisão ela é o ponto inicial da existência de dois poderes paralelos, chamada dualidade de poder, e, segundo, por que, que o Trotsky considerava esse o documento mais importante da Revolução de Fevereiro? Oi, é... eu não tenho certeza, mas é... o Soviet de Petrogrado foi o primeiro a ser fundado? Ou não? Foi, né? E o que aconteceu com ele entre 1905 e 1917? <risos> é, boa tarde, meu nome é Ledson. E eu queria pedir para o senhor se você pudesse falar um pouco do, sobre a relação dos militares e a população durante o governo czarista, porque eu não tenho muita informação sobre esse caso, eu queria saber se eu podia elucidar essa parte, por favor. Eu, na verdade, eu quero compartilhar uma impressão para ver o que, que eu, é, se é isso que eu consegui ler aqui. Mas, a, a, mesmo num contexto vindo de uma perspectiva de colaboração, quando eu leio as, o segundo, os, segundos, os segundos textos, né, os, os textos que a gente leu agora, me dá a impressão de que eles têm um tom, especialmente quando se dirigem ao governo provisório, não de uma reivindicação, mas de uma exigência. Ou se, aí, aí eu fiquei pensando se isso já refletia uma compreensão de que, de fato, o, é, o soviet expressava um poder real. Assim, né? porque, eu estou dizendo porque nós participamos de vários coletivos, de várias coisas, e quando nós nos dirigimos ao poder, muitas vezes é no sentido de reivindicar alguma coisa, e não da exigência. E, em determinados momentos, parece até assim que, que o governo provisório vai ter que cumprir, vamos dizer assim a impressão que dá no, né, quando eles se dirigem. Assim, é, muito, é uma fala muito direta de quem tem, de fato, o poder e só não quer tomar uma decisão mais... Quer dizer, só não toma uma decisão mais avançada porque compreende que não é o momento. Então, é uma, foi uma impressão que eu tive do, do texto. Eu queria saber se, o que, que o Kevin é, acha disso. É, eu gostaria de perguntar para o Kevin como é que surgiram os, os outros soviets e qual é a relação deles com o soviet de Petrogrado. Que eu estava lendo na história da Revolução Russa do Trotsky sobre a Revolução de Fevereiro, que é, tem uma parte que ele diz que o, soviet, que o soviet de Petrogrado foi um dos principais dirigentes da Revolução de Fevereiro. Eu gostaria de saber qual a relação com os outros. Ok. Um, oh, yeah. um, I should have mentioned that in terms of this issue of class collaboration, the formation of this document 
really did not come from the Mensheviks and uh, SRs, or the Bolsheviks for that matter. Uh, Sukhanov in his memoirs, who was one of the leaders of the Petrograd Soviet, describes how a very large group of workers, I mean of uh, soldiers, came in and they grabbed some of the leaders and they, and they said, this is what we want, you write this down. We want to uh, have elected committees, we want to make sure that the, any orders they give us do not conflict with the Petrograd Soviet. We want these officers to start showing us respect, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there's a major contradiction between this first document, which I think is a class collaboration document, and order number one. And order number one was important because it was instituted by the worker, by the soldiers themselves, on, uh, that pressured the leadership to accept this um, democratic institution within the army, these elected committees within the army. And this is why the question of why did Trotsky consider it more so important. The next day, the Petrograd Soviet issued order number two which essentially you said cancel order number one. But the problem was everybody in the country within a day knew about order number one because it, it, there was a sentiment that we wanted to have a, de a, a more democratic army, that we want to have these committees, that the officers are going to show us respect, that we're not going to carry out any uh, offensive actions without those orders being countersigned by the Petrograd Soviet. So this is why Trotsky considered it's a very... Um, I think I probably presented this in a, in a confusing manner because all, the first document is really, it is about class collaboration. The second document, order number one, really uh, caused problems for the war for the next eight months. In fact, when we get to the Kornilov section, they're very, Kornilov and the military leaders, I mean, right from the start are saying, how can we have a war when we're, when, these uh, soldiers are, t are electing their own committees and deciding what they should do. You can't have a war in this situation. How are we supposed to carry out a war against Germany under these conditions? So this, this document, this order number one, is a very, very subversive document. It basically undermines the war effort. And we'll get into some of the other issues that people have raised some very good questions, but we're, we can't answer all the questions in each session. But some of these questions, I think, will come up again in some of these other documents about uh, the Bolsheviks and some of these other Soviets. The reason the, Bol the Petrograd Soviet was the most important, quite frankly, is because it's the capital. So people look... And it's not to say the other Soviets weren't important. In fact, when we get to the section on October, you know, Lenin is arguing that we have to have the majority of Soviets on our side. Uh, the same Soviets sprang up all over the place, and it's not to just say they're not important. But the, the Petrograd Soviet was getting petitions and requests from all over the country because people recognized it as being in the center and, and having a more significant impact. It's not because the other Soviets weren't important, it's because of it was in the capital. Um, I would prefer, and it's not because of these questions and these comments I think are fantastic, especially the, the comments about uh, the soldiers. I really appreciate these. It's not to dismiss some of these questions, but I think some of the questions we will take up in more detail as we go along, because we we're now on document number two, and it's not, I don't want to give the impression that I don't think your questions and comments are not important, but I would prefer if we can move on, and uh, if you feel that we don't address your questions adequately, then we can return to them. If that is that fair? Okay. So, um, one point three. Yeah, number three. Agora a discussão do documento um ponto três. Se alguém tiver alguma pergunta, já pode começar. É, assim. Oi, sou o Thiago. 
É, assim, pelo que eu, que eu já li, pelo que eu já escutei, aquela história né, de que o Partido Bolchevique estava indo nessa linha, estava sendo meio que levado para essa linha de colaboração com o governo provisório, inicialmente, e com a chegada do Lênin, com as teses de abril, parece que, do nada, ele muda né, o Partido Bolchevique, né, a posição do Comitê Central e tal, mas, pelo menos, a impressão também é que, por esse relato, que é breve, é só um parágrafo, é, mostra um pouco que tem uma base, né, um setor da massa operária, portanto, né, parte do, da, da base do partido também deve, deve ter essa visão de que já, digamos assim, teria a propensão de, de assumir as ideias do Lênin. Né? Ou seja, precisava mais de um dirigente que colocasse isso, é, digamos assim, para assumir a linha oficial do partido. Ou seja, na base, nas bases e na base do, part, do próprio partido existia, digamos assim, uma base concreta para a linha política do Lênin, é, como é que pode dizer, pegar, né, para a linha política do Lênin passar. Né? Ou seja, não foi tipo o cara que chegou, né, mudou a visão de todo mundo do nada. Né? Assim, existia, de fato, uma base material, né, um setor totalmente inconformado que já tinha um pouco essa visão né, nos locais de trabalho, dentro né, do próprio soft, dentro do partido. Então, por, essa, por esse trecho aqui, é, eu tenho, me dá essa impressão, não sei se seria de fato isso. Né? A, né, a visão que eu tinha era... Na verdade, eu não tinha a visão, né, porque eu, eu, só o que eu sabia era que o Lênin chegou, com as teses de abril, virou todo o partido e ficava uma coisa meio desconexa. Né? O partido estava indo no caminho... Uma só pessoa né, chegou e virou tudo. Né? Então, aqui deixa mais a entender é, com, por que é que o Lênin conseguiu virar a linha do partido com as teses de abril. Né? Ou seja, já existia um grande número de pessoas do partido e das relações do partido, simpatizantes e aderentes, né, como ele coloca aqui, propensos a assumir a linha que ele propôs. Né? Então, a pergunta é se é isso mesmo. Né? <risos> you, uh, you don't have to pose it as a question. I agree 100%. Alguém mais? Oi, boa tarde. Me chamo André. É, na verdade, eu queria saber quem eram os pelegos aqui, quem são os três editores que, do, dos quais se exigiu a expulsão do partido. Deixa eu vou aproveitar, o microfone chegou aqui próximo. É, acho que isso é, é bem interessante. Né? É, se, por um lado, tem um setor que, como é, o companheiro falou, não é? é digamos assim, insatisfeito com a linha do partido, né? é, mas eu penso que isso só vai ficar mais evidente é, uns três dias depois, não é? quando é, o Mililkov é, fala da necessidade de se avançar na guerra e etc. É, e o que se coloca aqui é que a maioria do partido bolchevique, até é, 18 de abril, foi favorável a muito mais uh, uma aliança, uma aproximação com o Menchevique. Não sei se daria para colocar os três pelegos, mas né, Stalin, Muranov e Kamenev, né, acho que esses eram, digamos assim, uh, a principal expressão dessa posição de, de estar próximo do, do governo provisório. É, bom, esse documento aqui ele fala bem da divisão entre os bolcheviques, né, muito ligada à agitação do, da classe trabalhadora de Weiborg. E eu queria perguntar como é que se, essa divisão estava ocorrendo também entre os mencheviques. A gente sabe que tinha uma ala internacionalista, que era contra a continuação da guerra, mesmo que só para defender as fronteiras. É, mas essa ala internacionalista dos mencheviques, ela, ela tinha também uma base operária em Weiborg. Qual era é, a relação dela com essa agitação? das massas que estavam ocorrendo no momento. É dali que vem essa posição delas ou é de outro lugar?
Alguém mais? Não? Então, acho que podemos continuar. I, uh, I don't really have too much uh, to, to uh, contribute. I think the, the comrade made uh, uh, some great points. Uh, the issue of the Mensheviks, there were different wings. And I think in some ways we should say they tied in to uh, a popular sentiment. That is, with our revolution, uh, we don't want annexations and don't want to uh, carry out an imperialist war. But on the other hand, this notion of defensism was strong early on in, uh, in March and April. And, and I think you can say that even influenced some of the Bolsheviks. Um, uh, the question about whether the, you know, the different tendencies within the Bolshevik party in March, I think we can agree on one thing, that there's confusion within the, the Bolsheviks. There's certainly an extreme left in the Vyborg that Lenin tied into. It's not as if Lenin came back and waved a wand and wor the workers agreed with him in the Bolshevik party, that there was a sentiment that he connected with. But there were very different shades within the Bolshevik party. There were you know, Stalin and Kamenev tied into a conser more conservative element within the Bolshevik party that I mentioned earlier of, I think for understandable reasons, given the old Bolshevik position of the three, what we call the three whales, meaning a land, a eight hour day, and I'm forgetting the third, <laughs> land that they agreed on the minimal program. So it was quite understandable that they wanted to work with them. So it's not, uh, the conservatism within the Bolshevik party, I think, is somewhat understandable. And it's not as if Lenin came back and fixed everything. There was also a left wing within the Bolsheviks. But I think the comments, uh, I agree with uh, almost all the comments. I think it's a very good discussion. Um, so moving forward, one document I would suggest we skip, and I'll give a very short version of it, is 1.4. Basically, in document number four, the Petrograd Soviet says, we cannot solve the land question prior to the constituent assembly. That's the gist of that. And that is really the same answer to all the big questions that they're giving. We. The solution to these larger problems can only take place when we have an elected body. We cannot solve this question. The problem for the Mensheviks is that all the major issues, the war, land, control of the factories, bread, the, the problems aren't going away. And they're delaying the call for the constituent assembly. Um, so if it's OK, I would propose that um, that we skip document uh, 1.4, unless somebody has uh, questions or comments they want to make. And then we move on, just for the sake of uh, moving forward in the discussion, that we go to 1.5. Um, and this is a, a similar type of document that relates to the war. And we read this document, and then we can have people comment on that one. Bom, vamos abrir, abrir então mais um bloco de perguntas. Comments. Esse, esse documento parece representar uma esperança muito grande na democracia e na, que o proletariado alemão respondesse a um chamado internacionalista. Essas duas coisas me, me chamaram mais atenção. Perguntas e comentários. <risos> Acho que, fugindo um pouco de 17, pensando até mais recentemente, enfim, uh, me chamou bastante atenção que era dito aos soldados alemães para lutarem contra o despotismo asiático da Rússia, né? 
Então, é uma questão interessante da gente parar de ver a Europa como um todo completo, assim como um, um, um algo fechado e perfeitinho, e que essa unidade europeia ela avança sobre as fronteiras, e avança e recua sobre as fronteiras conforme a política necessita. né? Então, inclusive, com a queda do socialismo na Rússia, também houve uma certa reeuropeização da própria Rússia. né? Eu acho que é, me deu esse... Me deu esse insight aqui, a, a, essa caracterização né, da, do quanto a Europa é uma... A ideia de Europa é uma arma política, né? É uma pergunta meio prosaica, que eu devia ter feito antes, mas eu estava resolvendo um problema aqui e não consegui. É, nós temos hoje um problema dramático de comunicação no mundo, e a gente está assistindo o debate sobre panfletos que circularam numa Rússia. É, então, a pergunta é, quantas cópias tinham esses panfletos? A que horas ficavam prontas? É, como circulavam esses panfletos? A gente precisa reaprender isso. Yes, I just want to say, I mean, I'm from the United States, uh, obviously, and I, and I found this to be an incredibly uh, inspiring document and oh if we could say this make this kind of documents with authority in the united states today the time has come for the people to take into their own hands the decision of the question of war and peace right uh, we refuse to serve as an instrument of conquest and violence in the hands of kings landowners and bankers and by our united efforts we will stop the horrible butchery Uh, that should that should be our manifesto. Thank you. Oops. É a minha uma observação e, e não é mais uma questão é mais no sentido do que a Virginia Fontes mencionou, é, sobre esse jornal que a gente, acho que é o segundo, que, segundo começo que a gente está vendo, sobre o jornal, é, falasse brevemente assim as características dessa fonte, que como que era esse jornal mesmo, assim quantas páginas tinha, quanto que era, enfim, essas coisas mais propriamente da fonte e sua circulação. É, Kevin, esse documento, ele, como a Regiane ressaltou, né, aponta o internacionalismo, a perspectiva de fazer uma aliança com a classe trabalhadora alemã para acabar com a matança da guerra. É, recentemente, estava lendo um texto, ainda não foi publicado, da Raquel Varela, onde ela fala das deserções e, e como que as deserções atingiram um pico sem precedente nas tropas russas antes da queda do Kizar, mas, nos primeiros meses após o estabelecimento do governo provisório, houve um novo ânimo de ir para ir o fronte, de defender as fronteiras, já nesse sentido de não mais guerrear a, a guerra, mas de defender a Rússia democrática dos seus invasores. É, e esse documento ele é bem do início ainda do, do, da Revolução de Fevereiro, né, de 27 de março, se não me engano. Nesse momento, como é que estava a questão das deserções? Elas ainda estavam ocorrendo em massa ou já estava nesse novo momento de um novo fôlego é, para o pro, pro fronte, no sentido de defender a Rússia, etc.? Porque ele, ele contradiz um pouco esse movimento de deserções, né? Ao fazer um chamado, é, é perdão, contradiz um pouco essa volta ao fronte ao fazer o chamado internacionalista, né? Eu sou Marlise e quero fazer uma pergunta assim meia, meia tosca. Eu queria saber como o professor me responde quando eu, perguntar, quando eu pergunto a ele 
Houve feudalismo na, na Rússia? Sorry, an another uh, another Anglo intervention. Um, I mean, I think this document is an excellent example of the, the workings of ideology because they're all the fine statements of internationalism and so on that uh, uh, Fred liked. But it seems to me the, the crucial sentence is the one that says, we will firmly defend our own liberty from all reactionary attempts from within as well as from without. The Russian Revolution will not retreat before the bayonets of conquerors and will not allow it to be crushed by foreign military force. In other words, we are continuing with the war. So there are all these fine statements and they say to the, the German workers, we won't fight you if you overthrow your government. In other words, we will continue the war. That's, that's the political function of this document, surely. So it, it's, it's a good example of how one needs to interrogate critically s s statements to identify their real, their real function. This is the Soviet supporting the provisional government in its alliance with the Entente powers and the continuation of the war. This Therefore, is also the, effect, uh, the suicide note of the, um, the, the provisional government because it was one of the main reasons why it was possible for the Bolsheviks to overthrow them was because the provisional government continued with the, w the war, which was one of the main factors leading to the overthrow of the Tsarist regime in the, in the first place. This is a document that says nice things will happen in the future, but we will continue with the policies of the Tsarist regime in the present. Acho que está de bom tamanho, né? Sim. So I would uh, agree completely with Alex. This is one of the one of these types of documents that is open to different interpretations. Um, but I can tell you how people at the time, a few major figures at the time, viewed this document. Uh, obviously, the Mensheviks and the SRs who put forward this document agreed with it. Uh, so did Stalin, so did Kamenev, uh, and so did Milikov, who is the biggest advocate of war. That is, he read this document, and this is all in uh, uh, one of the chapters on Trotsky where he describes how Mulikov said, well, there might be some pacifist notions in this document, but really when it comes to it, and this is the foreign minister who is leading the war effort, says, I can live with this document. This is, a, this is okay. Now, who hated this document? Anybody want to take a guess? Lenin. Lenin's attitude was all this pacifist language and so forth. When it comes to it, it it's exactly what Alex says. This is a pro-war document. Uh, that is the way Lenin perceived it. Despite the flowery internationalist appeal, it was basically a, a, read by Lenin as being a pro-war document. And for the people who mattered, Mulikov and, the, and the, those carrying out the war, if they're satisfied with it, I think that's, that, that says quite a bit. Um, so this was not an easy document. You know, it's open to different interpretations, but those, uh, I think the key figures read the document the same way uh, Alex did. Uh, Lenin saw it as a pro-war document, and Mulikov saw it as a pro-war document. Um, I don't really have anything else to know. On the, some of the questions about the leaflet, I don't know how many leaflets. So the, the newspaper was printed in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, it was uh, four pages, and I believe later on it was expanded to eight pages. The major decrees, like order number, it, it really depends which issue we're talking about. Order number one, which basically undermined the entire operation of the war, 
was known throughout the country within days. Everybody knew about it. And, and uh, soldiers started electing their own representative. This was happening anyway, but it, was sanction it became sanctioned by this order number one, um, which is why the Petrograd Soviet tried to issue an order, order number two and why the generals were pulling their hair out because it really undermined uh, the war effort. Some of the other specific questions, I, yeah, I just, I have to say, I just don't know how many leaflets were distributed. But this is, this is the period, Feb February, uh, March, April is the period when um, newspapers and magazines, we have to remember there was censorship before the February Revolution, that these types of newspapers are not only printed in, the, in the, the hundreds of thousands, but if they make it to the front, even a handful of copies are distributed and shared by everybody. So people knew about these decrees. They understood that there was uh, an alternative uh, revolutionary government, um, and it was known by everybody. So should we, are, were there other issues? That, did we miss anything? Are we okay? So sh can we move on to, um, to Mulikov's note? Uh, and I, I just say a few words about it. I mean, so, so Mulikov agreed with this pacifist notion, uh, the defensive Mensheviks, who were the ones in charge, really, even though the SRs were leaders also, the ones calling the shots within the Petrovad Soviet were the Menshevik defenses. And they believed that they could pressure uh, the bourgeoisie to stop the war, or at least not to uh, take offensive action. And Trotsky, uh, in one of his ch chapters in volume one, describes how uh, the tentacles of imperialism were really pretty deep. The notion that they could just sort of turn off the war or only have it be a defensive war was a fantasy. That is, uh, uh, even the Italians were, and uh, the French were threatening quite openly that if you don't, if you don't carry through with the war aims, you're going to have financial problems. So the, uh, Trotsky describes in detail, and I cannot remember the figures off the top of my head, but the enormous debt of, uh, of the provisional government and how it really was not a question of choice. That is, and Lenin is very good on this, you know, that the, the notion that somehow the, the provisional government can be pressured into not being imperialist, Lenin is probably the best critique of that. Um, so Mulikov's note, so Mulikov basically agrees with this demand, and then he comes out in the newspapers and he says things, and this is uh, in an interview with the French newspaper, he says, well, you know, when it really comes to it, we're not against taking, uh, taking Turkey and uh, the Dardanelles and having some conquests. And this throws, um, this throws the... Uh, the defenses into a tizzy, and they get him to agree to this this note, but he is actually breaking with it. And, it, and it, Mulikov is not just somebody; he is he is the foreign minister, and it becomes known that um, that this note that is appended to this uh, this um, agreement that they will not take war actions. It basic his note basically says, well, actually, we will. It, we will take offensive action if it's necessary. So he's basically saying, yeah, we can sort of agree on peace generally, but when push comes to shove, we have a right to, to carry out the war. And uh, this leads to a, a huge explosion. Um, the, Petro the leaders of the Petrograd Soviet, the executive meet uh, all night when it becomes known that Mulikov has quite openly said that, yes, we're gonna continue the war. Um, and, uh, but they can't resolve what to do about it. They're saying, well, we, we, we don't know what to do. So this is the first time when this, this, uh, the, this honeymoon period really comes to an end very quickly. The mass is coming to the street, and there's quite literally signs saying uh, of two different sides. The middle classes, or, the, or really the ruling classes, and the workers, get into armed conflict on the streets of Petrograd, on ne Nevsky Prospect. One's, the, the, the militants on the left are carrying signs that says, down with Mulikov, down with the capitalist ministers. 
the, the ruling class, the, the, the men of property are carrying signs down with Lenin. So in a very short period of time, uh, the effect of the extreme left uh, of Lenin is having an impact on events, and there's a confrontation on the, str on the streets of, uh, of, uh, of Petrograd. Um, the short version is that essentially the Petrograd leadership agree to an amended note to the note saying that basically if we rephrase it, the war will go away is the short version. And if, uh, this is, of course, nonsense. And one of the documents uh, is Lenin's response to that, that somehow you can uh, change a few sentences in, the, in, in a document and this will stop the war. And then Lenin, uh, Lenin's response to that is in one of these documents. So that's just a, the, the, the point of the second section is this, this honeymoon period comes to an end. And it comes to an end because Mulikov and the rulers of Russia w really want to continue the war and, and uh, act in concert with the, with the allies. So there's a demonstration of about 25,000. Uh, there's confrontation on the, f on the streets. Um, Kornilov at the time, uh, and he's the head of the, uh, of the military in Petrograd, wanted to use artillery against the demonstrators uh, the Petrograd Soviet stopped him. They said uh, troops should not go onto the street without direct orders from the Petrograd Soviet. But this, is, this shows you how even in April, the extreme right is thinking about really mass murder. We're going to bombard this demonstration with, with artillery. So this is the first, the, the April crisis is the first time uh, that this peace, this class collaborationist peace, explodes, and it explodes over the issue of the war. So that's, that's the context in which we should read uh, these documents. Um, so we can start with, uh, I think most of these documents are a little bit shorter, so maybe we could uh, go through them a little bit quicker. We'll do the best we can. Okay. So any, uh, why don't we start, why don't we maybe read uh, the first two documents together and any comments from people? Não é só para quebrar o gelo enquanto outra pessoa faz a pergunta de fato. É, eu acho que o Lenny, ele consegue ser muito preciso aqui nas observações dele, quando ele faz a crítica à visão menchevique né, de colaboração ao governo, pega esse fato concreto para demonstrar de que a visão dele estava correta, né, que não pode se iludir. Né, aquele governo, na verdade, ele queria a guerra. E, por outro lado, ele chama os trabalhadores a se organizarem, né, é, a conversar com outros trabalhadores né, de que não pode ter ilusão nesse governo. E, ao mesmo tempo, ele fala não é a hora. Não é a hora de, de gritar abaixo o governo provisório. Não é a hora de tentativas blanquistas de tomar o poder, prender o governo provisório, né, que é algo que, inclusive, mais na frente vem a ocorrer e ele, novamente, né, junto com o Trotsky, dá aquela segurada dizendo que não é a hora porque não, não tem ainda a maioria né, dos soldados, não tem a maioria ainda do, dos trabalhadores, né? É, e, por outro lado, aqui na, na, no texto 1 e no texto 2, demonstra... É, não estou achando a palavra, mas a, o quanto os mencheviques eram suscetíveis à conciliação. Né, acho que pela, pela base social deles, não sei, né, eles eram suscetíveis a qualquer mudança de posição por parte do governo e eles voltarem a ao campo da conciliação, né? Porque no primeiro movimento eles próprios criticam o governo, né? Criticam o governo meio que surpresos, né? Com aquela ação e o governo com a simples reposição, não necessariamente de política, mas de discurso, né? Consegue fazer com que eles voltem atrás e voltem para o apoio político ao ao governo, né? Pronto, agora já deve ter uma pergunta aí. Acho que 
tem uma questão é sobre a respeito da mudança de posição do partido. Né? Eu acho que é um texto do Lênin, então, tipo, Lênin retomou o controle, talvez, o controle da, da edição do Právida. Né? Então, tem essa questão aí em relação ao texto da sessão anterior, quando se refere à posição defensiva, defensista no, no texto do Právida. Agora, a questão que fica é também aqui, se começa o debate da posição de, da posição do, mudança de posição do partido bolchevique de ruptura. Né? Então, necessariamente, tem a ver não só com o debate que Lenin trava no, no interior do partido, mas tem a ver com que o, a ebulição só, que vai se dar com a, a, a declaração do ministro da Guerra, que vai falar debate sobre a continuidade da guerra. Né? Então, acho que esse é um elemento que vai poder colocar uma pressão para que o partido, por si só, mude de posição. Né? Não é só a, a, o embate interno das posições mais extremas, esquerdas, da, internamente no partido bolchevique. Né? Eu acho que essa é uma questão importante. É, não, aí, é, eu só queria fazer um comentário que, lendo esses dois documentos, e depois também a, a própria resposta né, do Lenin, isso que, é, fica assim, o que passa é uma grande confusão assim, que estava acontecendo nesse momento. Assim, é, mesmo aqui, no, pelo que, né, nesse, nessa matéria né, do jornal Menchevique, sobre a nota... É, não, não parece ter também eles mesmos não parecem ter com muito conhecimento do, do que está acontecendo e depois o, o, o próprio governo é, provisório lança um esclarecimento é o soviet é, meio que aceita esse esclarecimento mas então assim são é, é um mal entendido em cima de outro mal entendido e uma confusão e, e me passa muito essa impressão de que é um momento em que não, ninguém sabe muito bem o que fazer né o que é, em como em como em como encaminhar né essa situação assim e, e a questão da guerra e outras questões é, latentes então passou muito isso para mim é, eu gostaria de um esclarecimento melhor sobre a correlação de forças nesse período porque o Lenin estava praticamente sozinho nos posicionamentos dele é, nos textos fica completamente claro que o posicionamento dos mencheviques e dos SR eram a favor do governo provisório e o Lenin é, tem, fica praticamente sozinho nessa questão. Temos mais? I think this last question is uh, is really the important one, or the most important one. That this is a period of flux. It's a period of change. Uh, Trotsky writes, uh, and he's quoting Sukhanov, who was a Menshevik, that after the April days, the Bolsheviks had with them a third of the Petrograd so, uh, workers' movement, less in the in the workers' section, but amongst the working class. This is a fairly dramatic change. We're talking about literally weeks from Lenin's arrival to the sentiment against the war amongst the, the workers to a third of uh, the working class by the Menshevik's own uh, admission. So Lenin, I think that uh, you're hitting on the important question is the balance of forces. The April days are important because it's the first time where this piece explodes between this on this class collaboration issue. And the Menshevik response to it, and I think this came up in, in some of the comments already, which I think are very good, the Mensheviks are viewing it as a communication problem. Uh, why, and the, the provisional government and the Soviet had, a, uh, had an agreement that there would be what was called a contact commission. Whereas any big issue, there would be some sort of agreement that they would communicate and they would collaborate on this and they would meet and they would discuss it. So the Menshevik view this betrayal by Mulikov 
as a communication problem, not a political problem that's based on the fact that they're imperialists, but, but they're not playing by the rules. We had an agreement. Let's, let's change the rules. Let's, let's have a little bit more, uh, better communication and we can stop this war. And of course, Lenin's response, I think, is very good. I think some people have already commented, this is nonsense, it's an imperialist war. You don't negotiate whether or not you're gonna have a war, you have a war. Um, so I, I think I really uh, appreciate many of the comments. Uh, I'm not sure I've answered all of the questions, but I think the, the major issues that, uh, the, the April days are important as the first confrontation. Uh, the stakes become much higher in June. Uh, the June days, and I'll just say a few words to introduce that section, is really an escalation of the April days by an order of magnitude. Why? Because of Kerensky's offensive. That it, for two reasons. One, the outcome of the April days is that rather than being on the outside as um, controlling the bourgeoisie, the Mensheviks and the SRs actually enter the coalition government and be, take on portfolios of the government and start agreeing to the policies of the government. And Lenin and the Bolsheviks are on the outside as critics of the government saying no collaboration. But we also have to say that there was sentiment, a popular sentiment, that prior to April there was only Kerensky who was a right SR. And there was a sentiment in this coalition, since it's, it, there's only one socialist. If we had more socialists, maybe it would be pushed to the left. That, uh, and I think this is, in a revolutionary situation, that's an understandable sentiment. But Lenin's attitude is not about having four or five or six portfolios. It's about class and whether or not we're going to, uh, I think this is why I, I included Lenin's document. It's not about uh, the number of portfolios. It's about solving the political issues which cannot be solved by class collaboration. So the entire April, uh, to, to sum up on the April issue, it's a harbinger, a precursor to J July, to the June and July day actions. Uh, and this question of the balance of forces is the important one. That is, it's a third, with, within just a month of Lenin's arrival, the principled minority of the Bolsheviks are starting to say, no, cooperate. It's not a question of, I think Lenin is 10 times better than me. He says it's not a question of communication. It's not a question of, uh, of having a better communication with the bourgeoisie. It's the bourgeoisie, they're the problem. It's not the communicating with them. So the explosion, the, the minor explosion in April becomes a major explosion in June. That is, by the end of June, the workers section of the Petrograd Soviet is behind the Bolsheviks. That's a major shift. And the June days start the Bolsheviks are having, a, their military organization is meeting from around the country. The, the, uh, uh, and one of the documents uh, I included talks about the fraternization. And this came up in a, question, a very good question earlier, which I did not answer. The Bolsheviks in March had nothing at the front. By May and especially June, they have agitation. They are calling f not for peace with, uh, just with peace with Germany. They're calling for an end of the war and fraternization with the troops. Not in vague terms, they're saying, we're gonna approach the German troops. And you can see in one of the documents, the, the, the level of frustration by the ruling class to this fraternization by the Bolsheviks. It's the order number one and Lenin's actions of the Bolsheviks to fraternize with the Germans is undermining the war effort. It's no longer, uh, we, how can we carry on this war effort when these Bolsheviks are undermining everything they do? So you can see by the response in June and July that all the problems that they've tried to sweep under the rug are really exploding in June. So June is important because at first, the Bolsheviks called for a demonstration on June, uh, June 10th. The problem is, the Petrograd Soviet says you can't have a demonstration. So you have a conflict between the Bolsheviks and what are, the anarchists at this time are also gaining influence amongst the troops. So this is not just the Bolsheviks, the extreme left Bolsheviks are starting to say, we should, you know, we have, there's hundreds of thousands of us now 
when they meet, uh, the, the Bolshevik military organization uh, meets in, uh, in June. Workers, uh, soldiers from all over the country arrive with s rifles on their back, and there's an agenda. And they have, you know, agenda item one through 15. And one after another, th the soldiers come to the microphone. I guess they didn't have a microphone, but they had a podium and said, let's stop all this talk and this uh, discussion. Let's talk about taking power right now. And Lenin's response, and this is his famous uh, cold, war, cold, uh, cold shower speech, says, comrades, and it's a repeat of the, some of the arguments he makes in the, in the April days. He says, comrades, we don't want a Paris commune. We, yes, we can take power in uh, Petrograd. Yes, we have the forces to do that, and we can have 400,000 workers, armed workers and soldiers on the street. But we do, our task is not a minority task to, for a coup. And I think if you look at his arguments in June and July, what we're going to hear over the next few months is going to be, oh, the Bolsheviks just wanted a coup. You can only make that claim if you don't read what Lenin is saying. If you read what he's saying, he's saying, we don't want a coup. We don't want a minority movement. We want a movement of the majority. And he says this over and over again in June and July. So the short version, uh, for time, I'm going to just summarize very quickly. The Bolsheviks, and this is probably the most peculiar vote in the, in the history of, Bol of Bolshevism. By a vote of three to zero, that is the right Bolsheviks, uh, Kamenev, uh, Zinoviev, and Nogin, versus zero, uh, with Lenin and um, Sverdlov abstaining, call off the demonstration. Lenin is not one to abstain, so you can tell that Lenin, uh, it's hard to read into it. Uh, um, Rabinowitz makes the argument that Lenin at this time was very conflicted in June, saying that if we have a demonstration, we're not sure we can control all these anarchists and these extreme Bolsheviks that are clamoring for power. So he says, well, let, maybe we shouldn't have a demonstration. So anyway, by a vote of three to zero, which is a very peculiar vote for a central committee of 20, by a vote of three to, to zero, they call off the demonstration. It, so the Petrograd leadership says, well, that's good. They've called off their demonstration. They're listening to us. We are going to have a demonstration on the exact same day that we start the offensive, on June 9, 18th. And Lenin says, good, you're going to have your demonstration, but we're going we're to organize the slogans for that demonstration, not you. We're going to organize. The, so the Petrograd Soviet is the one that ends up calling the demonstration, not the Bolsheviks. And the Bolsheviks hijack that demonstration. They, the, the, and if you can read in some of the documents that I've included here, that the leaders of the, of the Petrograd Soviet are pulling their hair out because uh, and Sukhanov describes that, banner after banner, down with the provisional government, all power to the Soviets, uh, this June 18th demonstration happens. Uh, I want to combine uh, the June and July days because it's really somewhat of the same issue. It, it's, the, it's the issue of the war that's pushing this forward. So in the July days, they had this, so a 400,000, 400,000 workers and armed workers and soldiers come to the streets of Petrograd. The, the Petrograd, the worker section of the Petrograd Soviet is now behind uh, the Bolsheviks, and the soldier section is moving in that direction also. So you have uh, uh, in July, and this is, uh, this really harkens back to the Paris Commune. In July, you have a semi-insurrection. It's no longer just a demonstration. You have Soldiers, you have sailors from Kronstadt, which is a, a naval fortress uh, uh, six or seven miles away, arriving. 20,000 Kronstadt sailors come into Petrograd. Uh, workers on the street armed. So the, the Petrograd uh, uh, Soviet is trying to hold them back. And you have workers and soldiers trying to arrest members of the Soviet and of the provisional government. In, Kerensky leaves for the front. When he goes to the Kiev station, several trucks arrive of soldiers looking for him to arrest. This is the leader of the government. 
trying to, to arrest her. It's not called by, uh, some historians make this claim, and it's a, it's a dishonest claim, that Lenin is calling for this arrest. Lenin is saying, no, we don't want to take power at this moment. But the movement is so volatile and so much against what the provisional government is doing that you have workers and soldiers attempting to, to arrest, and they actually do arrest. Chernov is the leader of the, uh, of the um, SR party, and uh, there's a fantastic description both in Trotsky's book and in uh, Sukhanov that tens of thousands of, of soldiers and sailors are outside of the, of the Torita Palace where the Soviet meets, and Chernov goes out to try to calm them down, and the sailors arrest him. They're so angry that they arrest him. And then workers from the Potila factory, 70,000 show up, and they, some of them break in, and they start looking for the, the Menshevik leader, Tseretzeli, say, we, want, we need to talk to Tseretzeli, and fortunately for Tseretzeli, he was not there. So you can see that this movement of July is more than just a demonstration. It's a semi-insurrection uh, in which Lenin is still arguing we cannot take power. And eventually, uh, the July days uh, is even bigger than the 400 days. It's a half a million, and it's uh, very different from the, from the early days of the revolution. It is ex it's exclusively proletarian and uh, armed soldiers. Half a million people on the streets. And, the, and what is one of the contradictions of this movement, I think, is best described in uh, Sukhanov when he says, when a worker takes um, a Chernov and he grabs him and he says, take power when it's given to you, you son of a bitch. So you have this movement that's saying you should take power, and you have these leaders that don't want power who are begging, absolutely begging, for troops to come and defend them to defend them against these same people that are saying they should take power. And ironically, the end, the end result of July days is that um, the, the demonstration, uh, obviously it does not take power, but Trotsky's organization, the interdistrict organization, uh, troops that are loyal to Trotsky end up coming into the Torita Palace and defending, saying, we, we will do our duty. We don't agree with it, but we're going to do our duty, and we're going to defend uh, the Soviet against any armed indirection. Uh, and it's so it's a very ironic that uh, that even in the next few days, in the aftermath of Ju the July days, that um, people would accuse Trotsky, who had saved Chernoff, and whose troops who were loyal to Chernoff and to the Soviet and defended them, is it being accused of a German uh, being accused of being a German sp a spy. So uh, I just wanted to draw the connection and then coming back to this very good question about the balance of forces. By the July days, there is no doubt whatsoever. They, the provisional government had no support in Petrograd. The, the, um, the leaders of the Petrograd Soviet are begging for troops and they can't find, the only troops they can get loyal to them are really not so loyal. They're Trotsky, p troops that are loyal to Trotsky and the interdistrict organization. Uh, but because of this fear of isolation, Lenin says we cannot take power. Um, so these April, June, and July days are connected. So what I would suggest is, um, you know, we can look at some of these documents. Maybe we could leave uh, maybe a few more minutes for reading, and then any comments on these, these just for the sake of time. Uh, we spend maybe 10 minutes looking at the documents from both section three and section four, uh, and then people, I think the, the comments are much more useful than what I have to say, that we can open it up to comments after we spend five or 10 minutes reading the documents. Uh, does that make sense? Is that agreeable? Yeah? So the, the other thing I should mention about the, the, the Kerensky offensive is that he claimed Kerensky claimed that there was support for it, but there was also a secret document where he admitted that he did, that the troops were not going to fight. Yeah, so yeah, just three and four. Any any All of them? Yes. 
So my suggestion is that people, uh, just for the sake of expediency, but moving forward a little bit, that people look through the documents. Uh, if there's a particular document that you think is the more useful and you want to comment on that, there's, there's quite a few. Uh, but in an attempt to try to um, have our seminar finished at a reasonable hour and have dinner, um, that we choose your comments based on whatever, whichever documents you want. We'll leave it open. And we have like a 15-minute uh, contributions um, for sections three and four. We'll combine those on whatever document you wish. Então já vamos abrir o microfone já para para a discussão das sessões 3 e 4. Quem quiser pode já se manifestar. O microfone novamente com Bianca. Isso aí. Nossa maratonista. Bianca e Sofia. É, Kevin, pelos documentos a gente vê bem, uh, pelos documentos a gente vê bem qual era o clima em Petrogrado, né? Cada vez mais propenso a uma posição de okay. é, bom, refazendo então. <risos> Fala alguma coisa só para ver se tá. É, tá conseguindo ouvir alguma coisa? Ah, mudou o sinalzinho. Liga to one. It's the one. Agora sim, agora sim. Ok. É, bom, pelos documentos a gente vê bem como que a linha política das massas em Petrogrado estava cada vez mais propensa à ruptura com o governo provisório, à ruptura com a burguesia pela tomada do poder por parte do Soviet. É, eu queria que você pudesse comentar um pouco é, sobre como é, qual era o clima nesse momento de junho e julho nas outras cidades, em Moscou, no, no interior do país, enfim. É, como é que essa correlação de forças estava se dando, estava se movendo, em que direção nesse momento em que Petrogrado já estava ali no, no auge da radicalização? Alguma questão? Comentários sobre os documentos? Talvez a gente possa fazer assim, uma a uma, de repente, ao invés de blocos grandes. Se não tiver nenhum voluntário, imediatamente. Comente essa pergunta e depois nós abrimos o microfone. A situação was that um, because it was the capital and uh, the intensity of the politics, that is, when one of the ministers said something or, or Lenin spoke at the Petrograd Soviet, which he did several times, or Trotsky did, it was in the papers and it was a response immediately. So the intensity of being in the capital and having things reported right, right away meant that in some ways, uh, Petrograd uh, was more radical, that it, it, it moved to the left more quickly. That is, in the workers' section, um, they had a majority by the end of June. In fact, we can see that in uh, one of the documents. It talks about the, the workers' section saying, we should take power in July, in early July. In some ways, the Bolsheviks probably benefited from the fact that there was an overrepresentation of soldiers. Because if they, 
if, if the entire Soviet was climbing, clamoring for them to take power in June when the rest of the country was not ready, it, it could have led to this. If you look at Renan's writings, he refers to the Paris Commune quite explicitly. So there's a fear of this isolation. Now, I know I studied Moscow, that in Moscow, it, it swung to the Bolsheviks in early September and other industrial centers in September also. So it's not as if nothing is hap happening in these other cities because all the issues that drove the radicalization, that is the failure, not just the failure of the provisional government, but the fact that the Mensheviks and SRs are now explicitly part of the government and taking measures against the interests of the masses discredits them, even more so later on when we'll get to the fifth section around Kornilov. But this radicalization is happening everywhere. So it's not, I don't want to give the impression that it's isolated to Petrograd. It's just that Petrograd is by far the most radical. So, so uh, and we'll discuss that in a little bit in the fifth section, uh, that after Kornilov, uh, it's, it's other major Soviets start swinging to the Bolsheviks. But this is, a, again, a very important question. And we don't have to guess. And in some ways, we know because you can simply see who the majority is. So we know by the end of June in Petrograd, the majority of the working class is for Soviet power. We know that a, a month later, even the soldiers are now for Soviet power. So we don't have to guess. There's resolutions at the factory level, there's resolutions within the different regiments, and there's also the elections, the, the notion of recall. You can get, you don't have to guess, you know where different cities stand on those major issues. But this is a, a very important question. In terms of discussion, the one document that, there's many important documents, but I think the one where the Soviet, the Petrograd Soviet, which at the time was still dominated by the SRs and the Mensheviks, they go to the front. Uh, 3.5. They go to the front, and by this time, the Mensheviks and SRs have given up the pretense that it, the war is just offensive because they support the offensive. They support Kerensky's offensive. And as leaders of the Petrograd Soviet, they go to the front and they try to convince the soldiers that they should fight. And what is the response of the soldiers? They arrest them. They arrest the leaders of the Petrograd Soviet. And they even threaten to kill them. Not that we would support that, but there's a, we're going to stop you from going to other troops and telling them that they should fight. We don't want a war. We're going to arrest it. So these people that consider themselves the leaders of the, of the masses have the masses arrest them and threatening, uh, threatening to kill them. Because at that point, and uh, if you look at the way the, the soldiers responded and said, well, we have land now. We're going to take the land. Why should we fight for the bourgeoisie now? They come out and they say this in this document. We don't want any war. It, the war is over. We're not fighting. So you can see that for the, for the uh, you can see the, what the, the Mensheviks and SRs are arguing for and also saying, well, we can't solve any of these problems until we have the constituent assembly. But we can't have the elections to the constituent assembly. That the masses are, of, of workers, soldiers, and peasants are starting to get more and more angry and saying, you're not solving any of the problems. You're not solving the issue of land, even though on paper the SRs, the Bolshevik, I think comrades know this, that the Bolsheviks essentially took the SR program. They said that land, prior to 1917, they had all the, um, they had a different program. The Bolsheviks had uh, the notion of nationalization of the land. In 1917, Lenin just took the SR program. Because the, the, the SRs were not going to implement this program. Lenin said, the, the peasants are taking the land whether we like it or not. We endorse that. It is a blow against the landlord, so we support this. So the peasants are taking the land. 
The workers are starting to take over the factories, which I haven't talked about sufficiently. And the, and the soldiers, irrespective of what the, the leadership says, are stopping fighting. And you can see by the other document that the fraternization is driving them crazy. That it's no longer a minority movement. The Bolsheviks now have agitators at the front that are undermining the war effort in which the, the, the committees are undermining uh, the, the, the leadership who wants to continue the war. But I'm, ta I'm talking too much. I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in what other, these are important questions, but I'm sure other comrades have uh, opinions about these documents. It's over? Okay. Okay. Okay, so my suggestion is that we have 45 minutes, that we divide it equally in the two last sections. I know we're going a little faster than uh, I had planned, but um, to, to, to finish at a reasonable hour by 6.30, I would suggest that we split the, t the last two sections just by time, so we have 20 minutes for section five and then uh, 20 minutes for section six. And I'll just speak very briefly about the Kornilov period and then we can uh, leave a few minutes for reading and then open it up for discussion. So the, Korn the Kornilov attempted coup is really a turning point. Why? Because the notion of class collaboration is finished. That is, the bourgeoisie and the landlords, by the late summer, are saying, we need to put an end to this order number one. We need to put an end to this workers' control in the factories. We need to put an end to these committees at the front. Those days are over. We need a strong man. We need a dictator. And the, the man they looked to was uh, Lavrov Kornilov, an extreme right uh, you could almost say proto-fascist, that he, he, even in the pre-revolutionary period, he talked about hanging the liberals. He's quite open about it. In 1917, the liberals are looking to him to hang the Bolsheviks. And in fact, uh, in this book, um, Rabinowitz documents that Lavrov says, first we get Lenin, we hang Lenin, and then we'll take care of, then we'll hang the rest of the Petrograd Soviet. This is their solution. So the, this, this, is the, this is the culmination of class collaboration in, in August. It's no longer a negotiation. It's time the extreme right, after the July days especially, Lenin is in hiding, Trotsky's in jail, Trotsky, by the way, is accused of being a German agent. And what is the reason for being a German agent? Because he was on the accusation that Trotsky was a German agent because he was on the train with Lenin. But Trotsky wasn't on the train. Trotsky was in a concentration camp in Canada trying to get back from New York. So they just throw out these labels of everybody's a German agent. They're trying to, they're trying to, after the July days, Kornilov is first and foremost about smashing the revolution. That is the purpose of Kornilov. This is the key moment. In my opinion, this is the key moment in the revolution. At first, Lenin believes that the Mensheviks have sided with the counter-revolution. Why? Because Tseretseli, the Menshevik leader is the one who issues the, the arrest warrant for Lenin. That he's the one at first leading the charge. But then these officers, these young officers, these proto-fascists, break into the office of the Mensheviks and break into the office of the trade unions. So they don't distinguish. These are all, as far as they're concerned, they're all reds. They don't have good reds and bad reds. They're all reds. So the crackdown is not just against the, the, Mensch, the Bolsheviks, it's also the Mensheviks realize that their necks are on the line too. So for, the, for a brief period of time, 
you have some unity between the Mensheviks, the SRs, and the Bolsheviks, not to defend Kerensky, even though Kornilov and Kerensky are at a conflict, but because they realize this is the moment when the extreme right is trying to smash the revolution. Now, the, the issue with Kornilov and Kerensky, it's a complex uh, negotiation that they have. But what we know, and what Trotsky documents, is that they were both for a dictatorship. Who would be the dictator, and what would be the terms of that dictatorship, they might have disagreed on. But the negotiations happened, and everybody knew it happened. So this corner love attempted coup is thwarted by the military organization of the Petrograd Soviet. It happened in other Soviets also. And it was not just a failed coup, it never really got off the ground. They had all these big plans, but the Petrograd Soviet helped undermine those plans by sending troop, the, the few troops that were willing to support Kornilov in different directions. But the big outcome, the important outcome of this failed coup was that it completely discredited Kerensky, the liberals who were supportive of the coup, and that there was no more middle ground. It is either it becomes clear to everybody that it's either Soviet power or military dictatorship. That's the outcome of the, of the Kornilov coup. So what I would suggest is uh, we spend a few minutes looking at some of the documents for the Kornilov coup and then uh, open it up to commentary on this period and then we can finish uh, the last section. Olá, boa tarde. Meu nome é Rodrigo. É, gostaria só de alguns comentários sobre a avaliação no discurso de 1 de setembro que Seretelli coloca de que a vitória sobre Corniló só foi fácil porque uma grande parte da burguesia não voltou-se contra nós. É mais uma pergunta de mais contexto. Mais alguma, gente? É, sobre o, o documento é, do 5.2, que é o do Svetia, de 31 de agosto, é, eu achei curioso só que, que, o, que a matéria ela, ela condena né, a tramóia do Kornilov exige investigação né, do, do caso rigorosamente, mas assim a, a um primeiro momento ainda reconhecendo né, a legitimidade do governo provisório de certo modo, mas ao mesmo tempo já é, dando, parece, parece que dando um tom um pouco mais é, agressivo no que se refere a um, um avanço da revolução, né, é, por exemplo exigindo que que os cargos mais alto oficialato é, sejam é, é, ocupados por pessoas mais comprometidas né, com a revolução, depois mais na frente é, exigindo que o que, ni, que o que o ninguém do partido cadete é, continue assumindo nenhum cargo é, e fazendo um apelo, né, depois no final só o governo que é claro e consistentemente revolucionário tanto em seu programa quanto em sua política é capaz de instilar a necessária confiança nas massas democráticas. Aí, não sei, me parece um, já um, um passo assim, um, um deslocamento, né, de, de posicionamento até em relação. Claro que aí já não tem mais, é, não tem mais conciliação nenhuma, mas assim já parece já um passo 
que caminha no sentido de acabar com essa polaridade de poder assim e, e só existir o governo revolucionário. Não existir mais dois poderes é, que estão ali é, em disputa. Tem mais uma? So uh, these two questions are, are very good and they're related. Um, first of all, the, the cadet party four times during August had discussions in their central committee about uh, a military coup. Their leadership uh, in the military played a role in the coup. Mulikov, at the very end of the coup was the negotiator between Kornilov and Kerensky. The difference between Kornilov and Kerensky really came down to who would be dictator. It, they did not disagree on the major uh, course of events. They agreed on this. Uh, the reason I included this first document, 5.1, and this goes to the question of the Menshevik Teretzeli's attitude towards it. At first, the Mensheviks were in denial of what had happened. That, uh, in fact, Teretzeli um, gave a speech where he said, well, you know, there's only some, some of these bad apples. That some of them aren't really all that bad. Uh, it's not as if the entire bourgeoisie came out uh, against us. This is a fantasy. This is a complete fantasy. Uh, this document, um, 5.1, the reason I included that is because by August 30th, Rich, the newspaper, they were complicit in, uh, the cadet party was complicit in the attempted coup, but by that time they realized there wasn't going to be a coup and were trying to get out of it. So their, their headline was a big blank. And then a couple of weeks later, everybody knew that the, the cadets were complicit in this coup. A couple of weeks later, this came out and it said Kornilov's aims are the what was this was the proposed headline this is the po the what actually was going to be in the newspaper that they pulled at the last second because they knew they knew that there wasn't going to be a coup they but it, it, the scandal was the scandal everything came out Kornilov's aims are the same as those we feel necessary for the salvation of the country we adhere to his formula in fact, we advocated it long before Kornilov. True, it is a conspiracy, but it is not counter-revolutionary. So they're trying to pretend, and this is, everybody sees these, this information. So Teretzeli, uh, the question about Teretzeli, how can he try to get out of that? That's what he tried to do. The, the Menshevik position, again, is we need to find some, some good bourgeois. But the entire bourgeoisie is behind Kornilov. And at this time, this is a time where Lenin, actually uh, in the wake of the Kornilov coup, makes a, a proposal to the, to the Mensheviks because it is so clear to everybody. Not only were the cadets involved, but Kerensky himself was involved. Everybody knew this. This is not uh, some secret scandals that somebody made up. Everybody knows this. Everybody knows that Kornilov and Kerensky were talking to each other, that they were in on this entire plan together. They might have disagreed on some of the details, but they were both conspiring for a military coup against the revolution, and workers and soldiers recognized this, right? So what was the Menshevik response? Well, they have a theory. They have a theory that uh, it's, a, it's a bourgeois revolution, and this theory just doesn't meet the facts. That's the answer to this question. It's, it, they, they're making up facts to try to retrofit into a theory that is no longer working. And Lenin, at this time, is saying, um, well, you know what? We don't have a majority in the Congress of Soviets, but we invite you to take power, and we will have a, a, a peaceful transfer to the Soviets if we are given the right to openly advocate our positions and criticize you. So this Lenin, Lenin in early September for a period of weeks 
says we are open to a compromise with the Mensheviks and the SRs if they take power. Now, why does he say they should take power? Because the, this, their entire theory of revolution has been blown ab apart. There is no good bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie, is the ruling classes are talking about, uh, uh, Kornilov and his men are talking about annihilating the revolution. There is no good bourgeoisie. So Lenin thinks that, the, the, that they're going to come to their senses, at least to the extent that they'll take power and they'll give us the right to agitate. But th the problem is the, the Mensheviks continue with this strategy, a self-defeating strategy. So uh, it's difficult to try to explain the Menshevik thinking. I mean, I understand the question, but the Menshevik, the, the problem with the entire Menshevik theory is that it doesn't fit the reality anymore. There's no good bourgeoisie. And this is also that this leads into the last section about uh, um, the period after the Kornilov affair. The entire, uh, the Vasilevsky uh, district of uh, St. Petersburg, the entire Menshevik organization as an entire group in that island, it's an island uh, in, uh, attached to Petrograd, that district, that working class di district of the Mensheviks joins the Bolsheviks. The Mensheviks are in complete shambles in this period after Kornilov. And why are they in, uh, in disarray? Is because their theory no longer fits. They have spent the previous six months in trying to, to put forward a theory of a liberal, moderate, good bourgeoisie that they can work with. And that same bourgeoisie is saying, it's time to slaughter the left. So their theory no longer fits, it no longer fits the reality. And this is the period where the rise of Bolshevism really takes hold. This is why, uh, in my opinion, the Kornilov affair, it's not just because they were defeated. It's not just because the Petrograd Soviet, another so it wasn't just the Petrograd Soviet, the entire Congress of Soviets from the first the first Congress of Soviets that's led by the SRs and the Mensheviks, they mobilize against Kornilov. But the Mensheviks and the SRs don't draw the lesson of that at all. So they continue with their policies. So the Mensheviks and the SRs, the Mensheviks on September 1st say, well, we can no longer have, uh, we can no longer have the cadets. Because if they were involved in this conspiracy, we can no longer have them as part of a coalition. The SRs, the next day, September 2nd, the SRs come out and say, we can no longer have the, S the, uh, the cadets in a coalition government. What happens a week later, 10 days later, they form a government with Kerensky, the person who was attempting, who was in cahoots with uh, Kornilov, and they, they continue in a government with, these, with the cadets. The cadets are given portfolios in this government. 10 days after they say we can know, because everybody knows what's happened. So even after, even after this attempted coup, the, the Mensheviks are holding to a theory of revolution where the facts don't fit. Except the difference between this time and the previous time is now they're gonna pay the price. Because everybody know, there's nobody in Petrograd, there's nobody in the, in the country uh, who's aware of the politics who doesn't recognize what the, what the, you know, and Lenin is very good on this. I quote him in my book. He says, it's time you gentlemen of the SRs and Mensheviks, you're going to pay a price for this collaboration. It's time that you're going to pay the price for this. You have been collaborating with these people. They're going to, and their goal now is very obvious that they're going to want, they want to put the boot in and you're still going to collaborate with them. So Lenin, after this period where he said, logically, there's no reason for them to hang on to this perspective because the perspective doesn't fit. Lenin says, well, let's, co let's cooperate with the Mensheviks and the SRs, and they don't draw the lesson. So the Mensheviks, the better Mensheviks, are joining the Bolsheviks. The SRs are in the process of splitting themselves. The left SRs are actually very close to the Bolsheviks, but that's another story. But the, the, the days of compromise after Kornilov are over, and that's really, um, so going into the last section, it's really, and this question that came up a number of times, is a very important question. It's no longer just Petrograd. Uh, and the other reason that, Le that, the, that Lenin breaks with this notion of compromise is because the Moscow Soviet, it's not just Petrograd anymore, the Moscow Soviet in, uh, uh, I believe it's September uh, 
12th. So September 9th uh, in uh, Petrograd, September 12th or 13th, a few days later, the Moscow Soviets goes to the Bolsheviks. The, so the two major industrial cities in the center, but an order of magnitude larger than, and it's not that the other cities aren't important, but in terms of the strength of uh, the, the radical left, the two major centers of the proletariat are now Bolshevik. And then the other cities are Tula, uh, Ekaterinoslav, um, Samara, city after city, Pet uh, Soviet after Soviet, is moving. everything is moving to the left. The Mensheviks are finished. Everybody sees the Mensheviks are finished. So this, this is the rise of really when the Bolsheviks become a mass party. And it, one of the things that I, I um, the, one of the citations that I found uh, that I really like is so the Mensheviks, and these are, these are men uh, and some women who had studied Marxism for 15, 20 years. And they came up with this theory really of class collaboration. And they, and they stuck with that theory despite the facts. They had, uh, this is the period when the Bolsheviks become a mass organization that, that, of going from uh, a minority to a significant section. This is the period late August and September when the Bolsheviks have 300,000 members, proletarian, they become a mass party. By being a principal minority and not making any compromises, they're bearing the fruit of that. And they had a questionnaire that they handed out. What is your understanding of, uh, of the Bolshevik program? And a majority of the, of the workers who, who returned this form, why did you join the Bolshevik party? said, our program is to fight the bourgeoisie. That's simple as that. They understood based on their experience in the class struggle. It's very, so Lenin's attitude is these people who learned in the class struggle are a lot better than these Mensheviks who spent decades studying Marx and Engels and, and didn't learn the lesson. So the Bolsheviks become a mass party within the working class and radicalization is no longer just in Petrograd. It becomes a mass party. The Bolsheviks become a mass party uh, and everything swings to the left. Um, so I covered that quickly, but what my suggestion would be uh, we do the same and then we can close the meeting. I hope we have some comments on this last section because there's some good documents here in, in this last section on, uh, on the rise of, it's really the last section is on the rise of Bolshevism and the swing to po Soviet power. I, I translated a few of the documents from uh, the Petrograd Soviet. Um, so why don't we leave like five minutes again and then we're, what time is it now? Yeah, so we, why don't we split the time between, you know, a good six or seven minutes to, to, to choose some comments based on these documents, and then we can, we can wrap up. Yeah, I think people want to go to dinner, which is understandable. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a, a few very, very brief comments. One is uh, in this uh, document 6.4, I, I think it's important, uh, the issue of Kaluga. Uh, in the historiography, there's a debate about whether or not the Bolsheviks should have taken power before the Second Congress of Soviets. First of all, they did it through the Military Revolutionary Committee. It wasn't the Bolsheviks who organized the insurrection. It was an institution of the Petrograd Soviet. The Bolsheviks are accused of playing dirty. But if you look at what happened in the days prior to this, that is the, the Kerensky shutting down uh, some of the newspapers, that control of the bridges of Petrograd, this is already happening. And then in Kaluga, which is a city about uh, 100 miles from Moscow, the Mensheviks and the SRs called in the Cossacks, and the, this Soviet, was, this is really the first issue of the Civil War. They call in the Cossacks, they bombard the Soviet. When they surrender, they execute some of them, and they smash the Kaluga Soviet. So if you look carefully at what the, the Mensheviks and SRs are saying, 
they're, they're baiting Trotsky and, and the other leaders of the military revolutionary community. Well, aren't you trying to organize an insurrection? And in fact, Zinoviev and Kamenev, it's not, it was not a big secret. Lenin called them the strike breakers of October because they announced that they're organizing an insurrection. It's no secret to anybody. And so in the Petrograd Soviet, the, the, uh, one of the Mensheviks says to Trotsky, well, aren't you organizing an insurrection? And he says, well, who are you asking for? Are you asking for the secret police? Who are you asking this question from? What is your perspective? And if you look at who's playing dirty, of course, in Kaluga, they didn't announce beforehand that they're going to slaughter the Soviet. They just did it. And what ha the, the important point about uh, violence in the October Revolution is that the entire proletariat of Petrograd sided with the Soviet. Why wasn't there violence? It's because they had 30 or 40,000 armed workers, and the, the forces in support of the provisional government were literally in the hundreds literally in the hundreds of people that were willing to fight for them. They didn't have a base of Kerensky, didn't have any support. So when the Second Congress of Soviets meets, it's, it, it's really the culmination of eight months. And the argument, uh, what I want to finish on is this argument about whether or not it was a coup. And I want to repeat the, the argument I made the other night, that it's 505 out of 640 or 650 delegates came to the Second Congress, and this comes to the question that was raised earlier, the maj overwhelming majority of delegates came to the con Congress of Soviets from all across the country, representing millions of workers, and they came in support of Soviet power. The actual vote, because the Mensheviks and the SRs walked out, and, but there were only about 100 of them, the actual vote was 13, again, 13 abstentions and three or four votes against Soviet power. And we're going to read, I can guarantee you, it's happened in the US, we're gonna, and I, I suspect it's going to happen in Brazil and other places. We're going to be reading about this Bolshevik coup of a minority. It's a lie. We need to, I want to encourage especially the younger comrades who gave some very good presentations. We need to have the facts. We need to read about, the, we need to read Trotsky. If we start with Trotsky, that's a fantastic start. They're going to lie about October. I can guarantee you that's what they do. That's their job. In the U.S., that's what they do. They lie about October. We need to respond to that. We need to be ready for that when, uh, when, uh, when this 100th anniversary comes forward in a few months. This is going to happen, and we're going to have to respond to that and say the, the, the October Revolution is not a commodity that anybody owns, but it's our revolution. You're not going to lie about it. We're going to respond to what you have to say, and we're going to put out what really happened uh, during the Russian Revolution.